I see Bruce in the attendees, so I'm going to move him. He didn't want any special treatment tonight. <laughs> Hopefully it's going to come on over. Sometimes I click these buttons, but things don't happen. Let's try it again. Here he comes. So Pam, are we good to go? Not quite, not quite. Um, I, I will just say there are some names that I don't recognize in the attendees. So Karen, if any of those people are you, you can raise your hand and I'll move you over to the panelist. Otherwise, I'll just assume you haven't arrived quite yet. There's Karen. Okay, so Mr. Marshall, you are the co-host. It is 6.33, Amherst Media is here. We are recording. You have a quorum, you're good to go. Okay, thank you. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of September 7th, 2022. My name is Doug Marshall and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.34 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022 and extended again by the state legislature on July 16th, 2022, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is available on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so, for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and return to mute. Bruce Colden. Bruce? I, I'm here. I'm sorry. I was losing my place. All right. Um, trying you. to open many screens. All right. Thank you, Bruce. Tom Long. Present. Andrew McDougall. Present. I, Doug Marshall, am present. Janet McGowan. Here. Johanna Newman. Present. And Karen Winter. Present. Thank you all. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. The general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to public comment during the general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when determined appropriate. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put, your back, put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. All right, so that's the end of the introduction. We'll move on to the first item on the agenda for this evening. Uh, and um, that is minutes. And I believe we have the minutes from August 
17th, our last meeting, uh, available for review and approval by the board. Uh, board members, I believe this was in your packet. Uh, Johanna, I see your hand. I vote or I move to approve the minutes from August 17th. As drafted. Okay. Thank there you. was one extra space, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. Uh, Bruce, I see your hand. Yes, I, I would. I would second that, but I also raised my hand, Doug, to ask whether you would uh, be prepared to read the attendees list as we did last week as well. I was expecting to do that, and I was going to wait a couple more minutes, uh, right. maybe after okay. we do the minutes. So this is just my second of the Johanna's uh, motion. Okay, thank you. All right, board members, uh, we have a motion on the floor and a second. Uh, are there any comments that you would like to make on the minutes as drafted? All right, I'm not seeing any new hands. Um, let's see, all right. And um, then why don't we go ahead and have a vote on the minutes? Uh, I'll do, a, do another roll call here. All right, Bruce, how do you vote? Oops. Aye. Aye. Okay. Tom? Aye. Andrew? Abstain. Uh, Janet? Aye. Uh, Johanna? Aye. And Karen? Aye. And I am an aye as well. So the motion passes six in favor, one abstention. Thank you all. So the time now is 6.39, and I will uh, read the list of names that I can see in the participant uh, box here on the Zoom platform. Uh, we have Bruce Allen, we have Doug Serrell, we have Mara Keen, Nina Theis, T-H-E-I-S, Pat Pattenode, and uh, someone named Rory. So that's the who has shown up as an attendee at this time in the meeting, about 10 minutes in. All right, we'll now move on to item two in the agenda, which is our public comment period. So as I stated earlier, this is for comments on topics which we are not going to deal with as part of our published agenda this evening. So if you have comments about any of those topics, please hold them until we get to those topics uh, later this evening. So um, participants, uh, public attendees, are there any of you that would like to make a public comment at this time? Okay, I'm not seeing any raised hands. Um, and we'll conclude that there is no public comment this evening. All right, the time is 6.41 now, and we will move on to item three. We have two zoning bylaw public hearings this evening. Um, I think they're both continued. So um, first one, in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law Chapter 40A, this joint public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding the zoning bylaw, Article 2, zoning districts, and Article 3, use regulations, and Article 16, FEMA floodplain overlay district. This hearing is continued from June 1st, 2022, to see if the town will vote to add Article 16 FEMA floodplain overlay district to the zoning bylaw and amend Article 2 zoning districts to add the FEMA floodplain overlay district and amend related sections of Article 3 use regulations to regulate activities in the 100 year floodplain as shown on the flood insurance rate maps issued by the Federal Emergency Management Agent, Agency for the administration of the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, 
the, the flood insurance rate maps indicate areas that have a 1% chance of flooding in a given year, the purpose of the floodplain management regulations is to protect the public health, safety, and welfare, and to minimize the harmful impacts of flooding upon the community. Okay, and then the second of the public hearings is the zoning bylaw official zoning map, the FEMA floodplain overlay district, also continued from June 1st, 2022, to see if the town will vote to amend the official zoning map to add the FEMA floodplain overlay district for the purpose of regulating activities as described in Article 16, FEMA floodplain overlay district. First of all, board members, are there any board disclosures you would like to make on this uh, regarding this proposal? Okay, I don't see any hands raised there. <clears throat> so at this time, Chris, I know you wanted to give an introduction and bring uh, our new members of the board up to speed and maybe introduce the topic for new members of the public. Thank you. Um, yes, hello, I'm Chris Brestrup, Planning Director, and I'd like to remind the Planning Board members of a few things about our flood mapping project and introduce new Planning Board members and others to the project. I have with me Senior Planner Nate Malloy. Um, AECOM is our engineering consultants on this project, but they are not able to join us this evening. So. Um, We've been working on this project for a long time, but most recently in 2022, um, the town council members heard a brief introduction to the project in February. And then again in April, uh, town council um, referred the zoning portion of this project, Article 16 and Articles 2 and 3, to the planning board for um, review, along with associated changes to the official zoning map. They also referred them to the CRC, the Community Resources Committee. Uh, and on May 2nd, um, the town council also referred the firm maps or flood insurance rate maps and the flood insurance study to the CRC for a recommendation. On March 16th, 2022, uh, the planning staff gave an introduction to the planning board members and then opened a public hearing on this project on June 1st of 2022. Um, this is a little bit of a complicated project. There are two different but associated items for the planning board and the CRC and town council to consider and adopt. And one is the items associated with the zoning amendment. So that is the text and the maps and the map changes. And the other is the uh, FEMA portion of this, which is the flood insurance rate maps, which are separate from the uh, zoning map and the flood insurance study. So there are actually four things altogether. Um, the town of Amherst is a participant in the National Flood Insurance Program, which is administered by FEMA. And this program provides flood insurance for property owners whose properties are subject to flooding. If the mun municipality in which the property is located participates in the National Flood Insurance Program. The town has been working on this project of updating the flood insurance rate maps and the flood insurance study since around 2012. So we're into the 10th year and we're hoping to wind it up this year. The purpose of the project is to create accurate federally approved maps for land affected by flooding in order to provide information to banks, landowners, the Conservation Commission, the Planning Board and other interest, interested parties. Amherst flood maps were last updated in 1983, and new and better technology for mapping flood areas is now available. And town meeting, when we had town meeting, appropriated funds during several town meeting cycles to update the Amherst flood maps. Uh, our consulting firm, AECOM, was hired by the town and has been working with town staff and FEMA to create these more accurate maps. In September of 2017, we had a set of preliminary flood insurance rate maps that were presented to members of the Planning Board, the Conservation Commission, and the public. And at that time, we became aware of a new method of analyzing flood data and determining flood boundaries. So town meeting decided to appropriate additional money to do additional studies to bring us up to speed with this new method. Um, the mapping using the new method has now been completed 
and they, we've gone through three appeal periods. Um, only the first, the, there was only one appeal, appeal uh, among those three appeal periods. So most of the preliminary maps have been available online since July of 2020. And recently we've revised some panels that have been online for review since July of 2021. Um, the maps have been presented at public meetings, including town council and the planning board. And at one of these meetings, it was held on June 25th, 20, 2019. And at that time, we sent notifications to all who owned property in the floodplain as depicted on the new maps. The old 1983 maps were based on USGS topography with 10 foot contour intervals. They were also based on data gathered up until the early 1970s. And the new maps are based on Town of Amherst GIS topo, which has one foot contours. So the contours are much more accurate. The maps are also based on recently, more recently gathered data. And that means the new maps are much more accurate in terms of showing the flooding area where flooding occurs. So what does the town need to do? The town needs to adopt the firm maps, the flood insurance rate maps, and the flood insurance study produced by AECOM and FEMA. And the town needs to adopt the zoning amendment and the changes to the official zoning map. Staff with the assistance of our state flood hazard coordinator, Joy Dupero at DCR, let's see, Department of Conservation and Recreation, I think that's right. Mm -hmm. um, has developed an amendment to the zoning bylaw, Article 16, um, which is we're calling the FEMA floodplain overlay district. We also have some additional um, amendments to Article 2 and Article 3 in order to um, establish this district. And we've developed a draft of an amendment to the official zoning map, which Nate will show you later. Um, the zoning amendment and changes to the zoning map that have been proposed because for municipalities that are part of the flood insurance rate program, they need to show that they can and do manage and control development in flood prone areas. So last time we met, we hadn't received our letter of final determination from FEMA, but that letter has finally arrived. It was sent out on August 9th, and we expect that the final set of firm maps with new dates on them will be sent out later this week. The public hearing that was held in June was continued to tonight in expectation that we would have both the letter of final determination and the new final set of maps. We have one, but not the other. And therefore we're recommending that you hold a discussion tonight about the material that you do have and then continue the public hearing on the zoning amendment and the changes to the official zoning map to a date certain in the future. And those dates could be either September 28th or October 19th. So what will happen if we don't adopt the flood maps? If the town fails to adopt the new flood maps, the town of Amherst will no longer be able to participate in the flood insurance program. And people in Amherst will not be able to purchase flood insurance through the flood insurance program. In your packets for June 1st, 2022, you received copies of presentations that have been given by AECOM and Nate Malloy to the town council in February. These are still available by going to the town website and looking on the planning board webpage for the packet for June 1st. Members of the planning board who are new may wish to review these presentations. We've also provided you with the minutes of the June 1st, 2022 planning board meeting, which describes the discussion that the planning board held that night. We recommend that you use the time this evening to review the text of the proposed Article 16, as well as Articles 2 and 3, which will be presented by Nate Malloy later in the um, meeting, and review the outline of the floodplain overlay district, which Nate will also present. The map can be viewed uh, as an interactive map that is posted online. So if people want to study it later on, they can do that. It's on the planning department webpage under planning projects. And then there's a whole section on this flood mapping project. Um, so we recommend that you continue, you, that you hear questions and concerns from the public and ask questions and concerns yourselves and then continue the public hearing. And we can talk about the exact date in a little while. Um, after the June 1st meeting, uh, Janet McGowan, actually, I don't know if she submitted her comments 
after or before June 1st, but in any event, Nate and I have met with Janet um, to discuss her comments and concerns about the earlier draft of the zoning amendment. And we believe that we've resolved the issues that were brought up by Janet as well as that were brought up by other planning board members. And we've revised the text of the zoning amendment based on those comments. So there's one more issue that I'd like to mention and that some of you may have heard about. Um, we've heard that some residents and a few counselors have concerns about the Tan Brook area in the center of town. And they're concerned that there's no floodplain shown along the Tan Brook. And one panel in the center of town is blank and is not included in the floodplain mapping. Um, so I'd like to talk about that. FEMA has a threshold for mapping that requires an area of one square mile of watershed in order to be mapped. The Ten Brook does not have an area of one square mile of watershed. The Conservation Commission has recently had a discussion about Ten Brook, and they in the DEP have been working on an issue of whether Ten Brook watershed exceeds one half square mile of watershed, and that relates to its potential designation as a perennial stream. I'm not really sure what the outcome of that discussion is, but I think that they have resolved the issue. But in any event, that issue is different from the issue of whether an area qualifies to be mapped as a FEMA or firm floodplain. Um, aside from the fact that the Tanberg doesn't qualify based on its size um, to be mapped, there are some other things that I wanted to share with you about having a floodplain designation on one's property. Um, the first thing is that anyone who owns property in a municipality that participates in the firm flood insurance program may purchase flood insurance. The property does not need to be mapped as a floodplain. The second thing is that flood insurance only covers the building and its contents and not the property on which the building sits. So some people in the Tanbrook area notice flooding in their yards, but damage to their yards would not be covered by flood insurance. And the third thing is that most property owners would be more likely to request that their properties be uh, taken out of the flood zone rather than being added to the flood zone. And that's for several reasons. One is that the value of their property may decrease as a result of being added to the flood zone. The second thing is that properties that are in the flood zone may be required to purchase flood insurance in order to obtain a mortgage or a home equity loan. And the third thing is that properties that are in the flood zone would be subject to more scrutiny when making changes to the property. And they may need to apply to the Conservation Commission to, for permission to do things, since the 100 year floodplain is considered a wetland resource area on the, under the Wetlands Protection Act. The Conservation Commission actually has other ways of figuring out whether a property is in a floodplain, but in any event, that's, that's a third issue. Um, so in terms of the vote that's needed, the town council needs to um, adopt the zoning amendment and the official zoning map by a two thirds vote. And generally speaking, we recommend that when the planning board makes a recommendation to town council about zoning amendments, um, we recommend that, that you also try to achieve a two thirds vote. Um, the adoption of the firm maps isn't really something that the planning board needs to make a recommendation on, but you are welcome to do so if you wish to. And those flood insurance rate maps and the flood insurance study also re require a majority of the town council rather than a two thirds vote um, to adopt them. So uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions that you have and listen to your discussion and um, come back to you with answers to questions if you have any. So um, I wonder if you would now, oh, okay. Bruce, did you have a question? No, I, I did. Oh, I'm sorry, um, Doug, Doug has a question. Yeah, um, am I correct that the two new board members are not eligible to vote on this because they did, were not members that when we initiated the public hearing? I believe that's the case, but they can participate in the discussion. Okay, thank you. So you were about to turn it over to Nate? I was about to turn it over to Nate with your permission. Yep. Certainly. Go ahead, Nate. <clears throat> sure. Thanks, Chris. <clears throat> and everyone, I'm, I'm Nate Malloy, a planner with the town. So as Chris mentioned, this has been an ongoing project for a number of years. The, um, you know, so essentially, you know, we had uh, consultants map the new floodplain area and that's going to become an overlay district in the zoning map. So the state needs to know that we regulate the floodplain 
And the way we're doing that is with an overlay district and then, you know, Article 16 that has all the regulations that meet FEMA and state standards. So it, you know, what we see in Article 16 doesn't apply anywhere else but this overlay district. And I'll share a map first and then we can go into the text of the language. Um, uh, that's interesting. Um, Sorry, I had a Zoom update today and it looks like, um, I have to allow Zoom to, um, hold on a minute, shoot. Not as well record. All right, let me see if I can do this. I guess it's a security issue. Uh -huh. Uh, so anyways, the, um, let's see if this works. Did you want to share those, the map? I could um, forward it to Doug. Yeah, let me see if I can try it now. I just had to change something. All right, here we are. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, I had a long overdue Zoom update. I never like to do them, but it forced me to when I opened it uh, today. <laughs> so anyways, the... Um, you know, the current, so in, in this map, uh, if I'll zoom in in a minute, the current maps are from 1983 and there's probably about 500 properties and over 400 structures that are in the floodplain. And then in the new floodplain, uh, there's still, uh, you know, like 450 properties, but there's fewer than 70 structures. And so, you know, the amount of properties hasn't changed significantly, but the number of structures has. And so what we have here is a comparison map uh, that shows, I'll zoom into this section, for instance, in the orange is the 83 map, and then in the blue is the current map. Uh, and then this data um, for the current map, the preliminary flood zone, it was based on uh, information from February of 2022. So, um, you know, it's more than likely the most current information. Once FEMA updates all their information, like Chris said, and sends it out, we can change this. But you know, so it, what it's done is it's become a lot more refined. So, you know, for instance, in this area, we'll just zoom in here. You can see where the flood zone is actually following the stream and topography along the bank, and then going up, you know, a little bit along a tributary. So, and in 1983, you know, you can see the stream. If you follow my cursor, you know, it winds here. The flood zone was a little less accurate. And so, you know, um, you know, throughout town, there's that's the kind of difference that's occurring. Um, you know, it does make a difference. For instance, here's Pomeroy Village intersection. You know, if you know, we would like to develop the uh, village intersection. You know, this area, this, this village along the intersection. So in this area, for instance, in '83, the map just made a broad sweeping. Um, you know, caught an area that was really outside the floodplain. So now you can see that really it's going to. You know, this property is above the stream. And so all this area in orange is no longer part of the, would be part of the FEMA overlay district. Um, right now, this map has both layers set up, 83 and the current. And so it is a swipe map. So if you want, you can turn it on and you can go back and forth to see what, um, you know, if you go to first, you know, if you go to this one, you can turn whatever swipe layer on if you want the 83 or the flood zone. So um, here it is town wide again, you can zoom into another section of town and you can go left, right. So you can hear, here is with both of them on and here is just the current one. So you can see what the changes are. So again, this is, you know, Pelham Road right here. Um, you know, most of this is conserved farmland, but again, just the accuracy of the new maps, you can see the outline, you know, undulates and follows topography a lot more. Um, you know, we can zoom out and go to other parts of town with this, you know, swipe on. So, you know, North Amherst is another area. It's mostly along the Mill River and Fort River that has flood zones. So here again, you can see, you know, in the North Amherst Village Center, there is significant difference in terms of what, you know, in the yellow and what, what you know, what's mapped based on the 83 map and what really it will be with the newer maps. And so the area in blue is what will become the FEMA overlay district. And so that's based on the firm maps. And so, um, you know, that will become an, a zoning overlay district. So, you know, just the things in blue. Are there any questions about the map or? Yes, Doug. 
Yeah, I wondered whether the definition of a 100 year storm has changed given the way the uh, intensity and frequency of rain has uh, uh, changed in the last 25 years. Right. I have no idea what you're talking about, Doug, but um, <laughs> yeah. So when we asked FEMA, our consultants, this, you know, we said, well, what, you know, does it account for, you know, global climate change or like you said, different storm events, events. And so what they said is, you know, the, um, the previous or the current maps from 83, really the data stopped being collected in the mid seventies. And so now they've had, you know, storm events and we're region one. So it includes New England and New York state and maybe some of Pennsylvania. And so it really focuses on our region. Uh, so 40 years of data, real-time data. There's also been in-stream gauges that measure stream flow, you know, velocity, quantity. And so um, what, when Chris mentioned that um, a few years ago, there was a new methodology uh, you know, new kind of equation that was used. Um, FEMA doesn't update their equations very often. And so this is like, you know, once every 30 year opportunity. And so their new equation that we started using takes into account this new data. So, you know, they won't say it's adjusting for climate change. What they'll say is it's based on, you know, more current events and they've changed their variables to factor in those things. And so, you know, so our understanding is yes, um, you know, the definition of a hundred year flood necessarily, um, you know, the, the elevations and certain things, you know, can be adjusted and the formula has been adjusted, but, you know, the say, definition of it is still the same, just perhaps where the boundaries are shown is different, right? But, you know, the 1% chance is still the 1% chance, but perhaps it's now covering a bigger area because the amount of rainfall or the storm events have changed. So, you know, the the, the floodplain is still the same definition as it was 40 years ago. It's just now the, the geographic area that it covers may have changed because of this new formula. Okay, yeah. thank you. And so I'll do a new share. So as Chris mentioned, the, um, there's this overlay district and then there's three parts of the bylaw that are changing. It's article two, article three, and then a new article 16. And sorry, Johanna, I see you had your hand raised. I don't know if you. Yeah, go ahead, Johanna. Thanks. Um, can Nate? Can you just talk a little bit more about what the like? What are the implications of the overlay district, and what are there things that you either like? What does it mean for the average person who might own land that would be affected by the changes in the map? Yeah. So I think you know, Chris kind of mentioned it. Really, the the impact is, um, it's probably like, you know, two big ones. One is permitting, you know, through conservation commission. One is financial, whether it's insurance or other things. So, you know, if your property is in, you know, has some portion in the FEMA floodplain, a bank may require you to purchase flood insurance. You know, if you have a mortgage or you're taking out a home equity line or other instances. Um, and right now our maps are somewhat inaccurate. And so, a homeowner might say, well, my home is really higher than the floodplain, even if the property, you know, it doesn't show it on the map and the bank might say, well, the maps are so old, we're still going to require you to get flood insurance. But now with a more accurate map, a homeowner could, you know, say, well, look, it only covers a portion of my property, not the structures. And so they, you know, may not have to get, be required to get flood insurance. So just having that accuracy of new maps is really important for, um, for a homeowner in terms of the financial impact. Um, you know, if you are, you know, some banks, it's different. I think lenders may be different, but, uh, you know, so anyways, it, to have a really accurate maps does reflect, you know, how, um, you know, whether or not you have to get insurance. FEMA also has a new way they calculate insurance rates. And so, you know, Amherst, I don't know if it's a high flood risk, but, you know, based on the new mapping, FEMA will do a more accurate job of calculating your flood risk and therefore your flood insurance rates. So your, you know, your rates are going to be more accurate than um, somewhere that has older maps. Uh, I see Chris has her hand raised. I'll just finish. The other one is permitting. So uh, the Conservation Commission needs to review any project in the floodplain. And so, you know, having accurate boundaries, you know, could save someone from potentially applying for a permit that isn't necessary right now, say if you're in the 83 map and now it's different. So, you know, I think those are the big ones. Um, you know, Chris also mentioned you can voluntarily purchase flood insurance if you're not in the FEMA flood zone, um, just if you want to be safe, say you're nearby, um, and you might have a reduced rate because you're actually not mapped as part of being that zone. 
So just having those maps, you know, can allow a property owner to make a decision about what they want to do in terms of insurance requirements. Okay, thanks, Meg. And then I don't know if we want to. Uh, I see Janet's hand. Um, thank you, thank you. Um, I was just getting back to Doug's question. I'm not sure I caught this. Are you saying that the FEMA's calculation of flood risk is accounting for increased rain or climate change? Yeah, so you know the the definition of the one percent flood um, or the floodplain, you know, is the same definition, but they've used more information, more accurate data to determine, you know, say how um, um, how big of an area that is, right? So, um, you know, they came out and they surveyed Amherst. And so they said, well, if this is the volume that is a 1%, you know, they've mapped it in a way to more accurately reflect, you know, the recent storms. So, you know, they've had in-stream gauges and they've had 40 years of data. Um, you know, it also takes into account like impervious area and other things uh, sometimes in a region. So it's become a more accurate reflection of, you know, current conditions. Okay. I mean, they won't, they, you know, they, FEMA, our consultant hasn't said directly that it addresses climate change. I don't think they look at it that way. They don't try to project. They use, you know, they only use, you know, collected data. So they're not going to make a, for these 1% maps, they're not going to try to make, put in a variable, some projection in their formula. You know, they're not going to say, oh, let's just assume a 20% increase in the next, you know, 30 years and somehow draw maps based on that. They're going to draw the regulatory maps based on collected data. And okay. so you know, but that has been, you know, like I've said, I, you know, I was told that it's, you know, they do have in-stream gauges in the region that they've been using to help, you know, calculate that. So. All right. Um, I saw a couple of hands for a while and they've gone away. So maybe you should, why don't we go, you want to go through this language in article two or. Yeah. So, you know, there's the, the three sections of the zoning bylaw article two. Article three and then Article sixteen. So Article two is um, the the section where we define zoning districts, and so really we're adding the FEMA floodplain overlay district. And so you know this whole this language will be you know would be new. So we're actually saying what it is. You know it's an overlay district intended to provide protection of and regulation of activities in the special flood hazard areas designated on the town of Amherst flood insurance rate maps issued by um, you know FEMA. Um, for the flood insurance program, the exact boundaries of which are defined by the 1% chance base flood elevation uh, elevations shown on the firm and further defined by the flood insurance study and shown on the official zoning map for the town of Amherst. And so that's and, the- And um, why have you used 2001, 2011 as the date of the map and why won't the map date be 2022? Well, it says as amended. So in 2011, the town actually went to the electronic zoning map as the official zoning map. So we no longer have a paper uh, zoning map as the official map. It's actually the online GIS is our official zoning map. And so, you know, we say as amended, so that captures it. So really the official zoning map, you know, it was adopted on two, in 2011. It's just been updated since. Okay. All right. Um, and so that hasn't changed, you know, since you can see the date, May 20th. So that, you know, that hasn't changed. If there's any comments, um, but that's, you know, that defines the district. Uh, Andrew. Yeah, mine is just a really quick one on word choice. Would it be uh, in the first line to provide protection of or protection for? So it's district intended to provide protection. I would think of that as for, I'm not a grammarian, but you know, All right, I'm not, I, yeah. I mean, if people disagree, that's fine. I it just, that's, it, it reads odd to me like that. Well, I can say it doesn't read oddly to me, but I could see either one probably mm -hmm. working. Uh, so Nate, maybe you can just think about that. And sure. consult, consult the town grammarian, whoever, sure. <laughs> whoever that is in town hall. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not, uh, yeah, I don't know. Chris and I, we can talk about it. Uh, and then I'll share article three is the next one. Um, uh, 
And so Article 3 uh, is uh, use regulations. And so uh, within the bylaw, there's a few areas where we where we discuss um, you know, floodways or floodplains. And so you know, we have 3.13 actually has development in floodways and it's its own little, you know, one little paragraph. Um, and so what we've added at the end is C Article 16, FEMA floodplain overlay district. And so, you know, this, you know, instead of trying to change this because it, you know, it could have ripple effects. Um, you know, we have a reference to Article 16. So, um, you know, that's just calling attention to it. And then the flood prone conservancy district, the FBC district, that's a base zoning district, and that's not changing at this time. And so, you know, there's still a whole section of, you know, 3.22 that has, um, you know, uh, development standards and requirements in the FPC, um, and that's not changing. So our FPC district, right, maybe, it, and it is, and is it says stricter than FEMA. So we don't allow certain development in our FPC, even though FEMA might allow it in a floodplain. So we're adding this language right here. Uh, the floodplain management regulations found in Article 16, FEMA floodplain overlay district shall take precedence over any less restrictive conflicting provision of this bylaw or other local bylaw regulation or code. And so, um, you know, it's just a way to, again, without trying to change the FPC district to align with, um, with the FEMA, because it, it, it actually be really difficult. Um, we have this, this, you know, this one, one statement here. Okay. I don't see any comments from the board. I will say that we've shared this with uh, Joy. Chris mentioned the contact at the state. So the process would be, you know, we'd want the town to adopt the zoning, um, the maps, everything, at least, uh, you know, four to six weeks before the due date. So, you know, um, we have until February of 2023, but the idea would be the town would adopt the zoning four to six weeks before, because then we have to send our local bylaw and map and regulations to the state then the state does their final review and also sends it to FEMA. And so, you know, this has already been reviewed by the state uh, preliminarily, but after we, the town approves it, we'd have to send it off to the state again, uh, and then for their final approval and then FEMA's approval. Um, so, you know, we, we've been doing that. So I feel like we're in good shape, but, you know, we, we still, we can't wait, um, you know, to the very end. All right, and then here's article, the new article 16 uh, as of September 2nd. So. Chris mentioned that this incorporates, um, you know, comments from Janet um, and other, you know, there's some other public comments since we last presented it. The, um, you know, so what the state wants to see is that we regulate uh, development in the floodplain. And, you know, we thought the easiest way to go about this was to create this, you know, this own article in relationship to the overlay district, as opposed to trying to have a piecemeal approach. So, you know, we could say that there was some the state looked at it and said, you know, your FBC does it a little bit, your wetlands regulations does it a little bit, but it doesn't, it doesn't all capture it very well. And so instead of trying to have, you know, 20 different sections in our bylaw, we created this, you know, concise section um, that meets both the state standards and FEMA standards. So it has, um, you know, an intent and purpose. Um, and, you know, those have and change, you know, so whatever is shown in track changes here is what's changed since since June. Uh, so you know, we um, updated the prevent the occurrence of public emergencies, uh, contamination and pollution from flooding. Um, we also added another purpose to allow the floodplain to operate naturally and drain flood, flood waters without excessive development that can add to flooding. So you know, here's the intent and purpose. Um, the definitions, which I just wanna stress, the definitions only apply within the FEMA floodplain overlay district. So you know, we define historic structures in, in this section, right? We define development, um, but that only applies within the overlay, within that mapped area that I showed. So it doesn't apply to other parts of the bylaw. Um, so, you know, someone couldn't point to this and say, well, you know, I have a historic structure because of this definition in this section. It really only applies uh, within that FEMA overlay. Um, so, you know, these haven't changed much. We deleted a flood hazard boundary map because we don't have that in Amherst. We actually will have approved firm maps. 
Um, you know, the state had said, Janet, you know, so a few people have asked what these references are right here, base code, chapter two, section 202, and there's referenced here. Um, you know, the state said we can delete all those references. So it's either to, you know, state building code, um, you know, code of federal, you know, code of federal regulations or FEMA standards. So we don't, it's actually not required to be in the bylaw. So um, we've left them in, but we could delete them, I guess, um, if people find that confusing. Um, you know, so this hasn't changed much. Um, we did uh, clarify start of construction that um, is the date of issuance of a building permit for new construction and or substantial improvements to existing structures. The actual start of construction must commence within 100 day, 180 days of issuance of the building permit. So before it was kind of a run on sentence and then we you know, put this on a second paragraph, the actual start of construction means the first placement of permanent construction of a building on a site, and then the, it goes on to define it. So again, this is only relevant to what's happening in the FEMA floodplain overlay district. It's not, you know, this definition wouldn't apply to other parts of the bylaw. Uh, and then substantial repair of a foundation, you know, we separated it out a bit to A and B. Um, as I mentioned, there aren't too many structures within the floodplain anymore. You know, there's about 70 um, as opposed to a few hundred. Um, one thing that we've done, section 16.2, designation of a floodplain administrator. We've designated the planning director um, to be the floodplain administrator. Uh, FEMA does require this now that there is a person who coordinates, um, you know, it doesn't have to be the person who actually goes through the permitting with an applicant, but really has to just make sure that we're following all the regulations. So the floodplain administrator is really a coordinator. You know, they'll just make sure that projects are getting the permitting they need, um, and then if there's any map changes or appeals about FEMA's maps, uh, they're involved with that with the community. Um, we list the duties of the floodplain administrator and the bylaw doesn't need to do this. And so many communities don't list the duties just because you know, if they change and it's in the bylaw, then you have to change the bylaw. So we've said may include um, and we've deleted a few and we've just clarified some. So working with appropriate local staff to coordinate compliance issues and enforcement actions. Um, so, you know, we do think it's important just to lay this out, what the coordinator will be doing. Uh, it also helps applicants and other town boards and committees, but, you know, it's not a requirement of the bylaw necessarily or, or FEMA. Um, the state likes that we have it in here, though, just it's, it's thorough. Um, uh, let's see if we keep going down. There's regulations. So the big piece is 16.3. You know, we have a, a, a number of regulations within the floodplain overlay district. And so... Uh, 16.31, um, FEMA wants to know that we somehow review or permit all activities in a floodplain. And so we've deleted a bunch from this section you can see here in the sidebar. And so originally we said something about like having a checklist and you'd go through and it was somewhat confusing because there's so many different types of permits. And so really um, this first paragraph is language. Um, you know, this, this right here is kind of required that the state asks that we say something that we re we review work for all for everything that's highlighted here. So we say that the town of Amherst requires a permit for all proposed construction or other development in the FEMA floodplain overlay district, including, and then it kind of defines what that is, new construction or changes to existing buildings, placement of manufactured homes, placement of agricultural facilities, placement of fill, fences, sheds, storage facilities or drilling, mining, paving, and any other development that might increase flooding or ad adversely impact flood risk to other properties. Um, what we do go on to say though, without saying you know, that we have a checklist is that the town's permit review process includes the requirement that the proponent obtain all local state, federal and federal permits necessary in order to carry out the proposed development in the FEMA floodplain overlay district. In addition to any building permit or other local, federal, local state or federal permits needed, any development in the FEMA floodplain overlay district shall require a review by the wetlands administrator to determine if review by the review and approval by the conservation commission is required. And so the floodplain overlay is a re regulated area by mass DEP. So the conservation commission will typically um, review any work in the floodplain. There are a few instances when it wouldn't need a, a, a permit by the conservation commission. In that instance, the flood, the wetlands administrator will actually kind of administratively approve it. And the way it works right now 
uh, when even a building permit comes in or even an electrical permit for interior work comes in and the property is in the floodplain overlay district, the wetlands administrator has to check off on that, has to approve it. So they have to, re they review any permit that comes in. So they, you know, they'll say, oh, it's just, you know, you're changing out light bulbs or new fixtures on the interior of your building. It really doesn't need a permit. So we already have this step in place um, and we're just, you know, we're, we're saying it now in the bylaw. So that's what FEMA wants to know that we'll, you know, we'll make sure that, you know, development has the right permitting uh, requirements. Um, if I could just jump in, the reason we put that sentence in about the wetlands administrator, it was sort of a tip out, tip off to the applicant that they should go that route, even if it's it's not intuitive. I think that if you were changing your lighting inside a building, you have to go to the wetlands administrator. So that sentence is really for anyone reading the bylaw to think, oh, I have to do that. So, right, yeah, I'm not sure people even know that that happens uh, internally. That you know they that this that the wetlands administrator looks at all those permits. Um, you know, and the rest of this, these regulations are, um, so the state, you know, there's a, in the letter of final determination that was sent, it mentioned that we had to comply with a CFR, a, a code of federal regulation. And the state created a model bylaw uh, that adapted the federal regulations into local, um, into say a bylaw format. And that's what these next sections are. So, you know, 16.32 floodway encroachment, um, 0.33, all of these um, sections are really adapted from the federal regulations that the state has, you know, wants us to include in our bylaw. So they really haven't changed much. We, um, we did say review by town staff for subdivision approval that all subdivision proposals and development proposals in the FEMA floodplain overlay district shall be reviewed by town staff to assure that, you know, they meet these standards. Um, base flood elevation, it's really interesting for subdivision proposals. Uh, when proposing subdivisions or other developments greater than 50 lots and or five acres, the proponent must provide technical data um, on the flood elevation. So we clarified that before it said something like five lots and, uh, or five acres, whichever is less. And so um, we just you know, try to clarify that language. Uh, same with recreational vehicles. We just added FEMA's flood zone regulation. So, you know, FEMA does allow recreational vehicles like an RV or a camper to be stored in a floodplain. Um, and so the town, you know, would as well if it's, you know, temporarily there. Um, water course alterations, again, proposed, you know, we were saying that they would have to, um, any in a riverine situation, the flood plan administrator shall notify the following of any proposed or actual alterations or relocations of a water course. So, you know, if in the odd chance someone proposes to change the Mill River, then we would, you know, have to go through this notification process. Um, so they do allow um, 16.38 and 16.39, uh, you can get variances. Um, and we just, I know, clarified this a little bit and just, um, you know, I mean, really just clarified it a little bit that the flow plan administrator would sign the letter uh, for a variance. And so, um, and then we changed the enforcement piece to the building commissioner. The state said the flow plan administrator may, it may be inconsistent that they are the enforcement mechanism. Um, the building commissioner really actually has that ability as a zoning enforcement officer. So we made that change. And so, um, again, the enforcement piece, we have an enforcement section in our zoning bylaw, which could um, work for the FEMA overlay district, but we've included our own enforcement section here. Um, you know, so it's, it's somewhat redundant, but it's really just specific to the FEMA overlay district. If we didn't have this, any enforcement would default to the other enforcement section in the bylaw. And so uh, that's, that's it. Hey, Nate, I had two sort of minor comments sure. back early in the in the document. Under 6, 1606. 1606, yes. Yeah, I wondered why you wanted to use the word excessive and why that couldn't be struck. I mean, you, you want to allow some development that would, that would uh, you know, 
caused the floodplain to operate unnaturally and you know add to flooding but you but you only want to prohibit excessive flooding <laughs> you know excessive right. development yeah we could um we can i mean it just seemed unnecessary and kind of calling into question you know it, right. it creates that opportunity to argue about how much development is okay right and then then the second thing was on the next page um where you referenced the uh the base code and uh, that's in the third paragraph there yeah um Who's, whose base code is that? Is there an agency or an entity that you could reference that would just make it clear where that's coming from? Yeah, when I asked the state, uh, Joy, she just, she, I asked her, um, I copied this and we have the you know, US, we have the um, US code of federal regulation. So for the base code, chapter two, section 202, I think she said that that was, uh, she, in an email, she said it was either the state building code or some state regulation, but she, Joy kind of indicated it would it might be better just to delete all these um uh -huh. all these references just but um right we could we could say like you know state regulation or whatever you know if this was a CMR yeah well yeah. I mean I I kind of like having them just it kind of makes right. gives gives it more authority it, but right. but you know it's 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 always this frustrating to not know what you're referring to so no yeah agreed yeah just just a comment all right uh chris i see your hand so i was just going to say i think it would be pretty easy to get the actual references from joy and maybe we should just go ahead and do that yeah no chris in an email she did uh provide that mm -hmm. um but she only she did it in a bulleted list and didn't you know cross reference it to certain things but she said what the sources were mm -hmm. um so I guess I'm going to ask one, one other question. I do see Janet's hand. Um, so if I have a property and I'm in a floodplain, <clears throat> it's potential that I'm, that I'm in the flood prone zoning district, that, that I'm subject to the town's requirements for flood prone properties that's that's not just the zoning district and I'm and I'm subject to, to section 16 right so I could have three parts of the zoning code that apply to my property that I need to look at all three and is that going to feel like a burden that's why we have staff to help a property owner <laughs> so yeah so you know for Doug's point um you know, this is North Amherst, you know, the FBC zoning district, you know, is much bigger, right? It comes in, you know, covers areas out here that are not part of the FEMA overlay, right? So this property owner, if they, if they wanted to say, oh, I could, could I develop here? Well, if it's in the FBC, that's right, that has its own standards, then it has, you know, the revised flood map. And so now it has the FEMA over overlay district. And then there's, you know, possibly you know, conservation commission review and others. So yeah, I I mean, um, you know, that's just what it is. I don't know. It's okay. All right, Janet. Um, I I found the references to state and federal law confusing because it just seemed to just sort of stick there. I didn't know what the base code was. I've never heard that used in state law. But I also wondered what would happen if the code of federal regulations or the US code section number changed or the base code changed? Like, what does it mean to stick in this, you know, 2022 references and five years later, it's really in a different place? So I kind of, I'm sort of, at first I was like, ah, who cares? And now I'm kind of thinking maybe confusing or inflexible like you don't want to have to come back to town council saying we want to make the reference to the u.s code different so like what does it do like does it yeah. help people Sorry, understand? I think, and i think you're right um that just happened with our block grant um contracts the state or the the federal government updated the their their codes for block grant pieces so just the the references changed to like section three and a few things and so 
um, we just had a contract be reviewed by DHCD and they said, oh, these references need to change. I mean, it's just like, right, it's like 24 CFR, 500 point whatever, right? These little references. So out of a 150 page document, they said, oh, your a few references are wrong. And I said, well, what's wrong? Is it the reference or is it the language? And they said, no, it's just the reference, just that reference changed, the section number changed. So we had to go and change our contracts because these three references changed. And so to your point, I do think that if the federal code changed and that reference was wrong, and it was no longer whatever, 44, you know, 44 section, whatever, then our bylaw would have to be updated to correct for that. So, you know. It, well, I guess that's an argument to take them out. Yeah, does it serve enough of a purpose to keep it? Like who, who does it help to leave it in? Yeah, I mean, I guess, would it be, I mean, if we deleted it, um, I mean, would we ever have, you know, we have a, the beginning paragraph that says the definitions shall apply only within the FEMA overlay district. Would we say something that the definitions are derived from, you know, state building code, federal regulation, and, you know, just make a reference to those few, few sections, those codes without, you know, being too specific. That might help. That might be good. You're kind of serving the purpose, but not, you know, freezing yourself in time. Are there any other comments from board members? All right. Um, why don't we see if there are any attendees in the public who want to make any comments? Are there any members of the public that would like to comment on these proposed changes to the zoning code or the zoning bylaw? I am not seeing any hands raised from the public. Okay, so thanks, Nate. Um, Chris, you're suggesting that we continue this? Yes, I'm suggesting that you continue it. And then there's a discussion about the fact that you only have one scheduled uh, meeting in October. And the reason for that is there's a um, Yom Kippur is on October 4th and 5th. And so you wouldn't have a meeting on October 5th. Um, you could, much to Pam's d uh, dismay, have a meeting on September 28th. Ah. Um, just to tackle this issue. Or you could uh, have a meeting on October 19th about this issue. So one of those two dates would be appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, well, I can say personally, I will not be able to attend the September 28th meeting. Um, I, you know, October 19th, I think was the other date and that that's feasible. Mm -hmm. It would be um, important to have um, five members, I believe. Well, I would like to have five five, five members that can vote. So present in voting, yeah. So it's all mm -hmm. the so it makes it sound like I'm critical for that meeting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but will we have the firm maps by then? Well, they've told us that the firm maps will be sent out um, this week. Now we've heard from them in the past about promises and they haven't been achieved. But I would like to put my faith in them and think that the maps will be sent out this week. Mm -hmm. But to your point, Doug, I mean, if you waited, it would at least, I would assume by the October meeting, we'd have all the right. Yeah. And people documents. would have had a chance to look at them and right. review them. Yeah. We have a meeting on the 21st too, right? You do. Yep. Mm -hmm. Is that agenda full? That is, well, it's got the Archipelago 47 Olympia Drive on it. So um, so that's going to be a good long conversation. Yeah. I guess the question that I have is whether these firm maps are going to be controversial or whether we're going to have a long conversation about them or whether it's something we could sort of, you know, see, see them, say yeah. they look great and make it, take our vote and move on to the archipelago project. Well, you could do that. I don't know. I mean, so here's the other thing. Um, You're under some sort of timeline too. So if the October meeting is a problem from that point of view, 
that might influence what we do this month? I don't think October is a problem. I think um, so the CRC is meeting tomorrow and they're going to be reviewing essentially the same things that you just reviewed tonight. And then they were proposing to continue their public hearing until October 27th. So that would mean that both meetings would be in October and then we'd get that over with and then the town council could review this in November. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping. Bruce. They've had two meetings, town council does. Yep. Bruce, you're muted. What What would you like to say? Um, I was just thinking, um, that uh, would it be possible to schedule it for the 21st, uh, for the first meeting with the archipelago and to, instead of taking it first, take it second. And if the archipelago went too long, the, the simple act of the 21st could be to continue it to the following week and there would be enough time to advertise that meeting. Uh, make, uh, so long as you knew that you're the five of you who must vote would be available for that date and so you might be able to get it done on the 21st but otherwise there's a fallback uh, the only thing i would change is we would not at, on the 21st we would need to continue it to the october date right uh because i would not be available on the 28th oh, of september no i i'm sorry i may have got the october meeting yeah. dates wrong but uh okay would, uh, so the but the, the question was i think the archipelago meeting was before the October option. Could could the new members just view the hearing pre we had previously? I can't remember if it was in June or would that cure our numbers problem? Chris, you're muted. So that would be a question for KP Law. But last time we dealt with this issue was when um, Doug had newly joined the planning board and he um, missed the first public hearing session because he wasn't yet a member. And then um, the decision came down that he would not be able to vote on the project because he had missed that session and couldn't catch up by watching it since he hadn't been a member at that time. But if we wanted to pursue this, I could uh, contact KP Law and ask them. This is different from a public hearing with regard to um, you know, an adjudicatory hearing like a special permit or a site plan review. So there could be some difference. Well, in the way this I is think treated, at, that, at that time, we were not doing remote meetings, mm. you know, and it does seem like we're in a slightly different world now. So, you know, I don't know how extensive or how much time it would take with KP to pose that question, but it, it might be helpful to know going forward. Yeah, um, I would do that. I'm a little surprised that I'm the last one that this issue was that came up with. Um, we've had several other new members since then. I will check that out. But at this All point, right, so at this point, should we just continue to the 21st? Yep. And you know, at at worst, I guess we could just perfunctorily continue on to October without even mm -hmm. doing anything else. Yep. Okay, so Chris, what time? Oh, there you are. You disappeared from my screen. Um, <laughs> sorry. What time on the 21st? Um, we must have continued Archipelago to 6.35. Yeah, we did. You want to give them a, an hour nominally <laughs> and say 7, 7.35 or something? I'm yes, sure we'll, I'm sure we'll need more than an hour, but I'm noticing that you have one other thing, which is Article 14. We are going to bring that back to you on the 21st, um, but I don't think we had a particular time for that. So and John, Jonathan Gerfine, too. Was he planning to come back on the 21st, Chris? He was, but we might be able to push him off until October if people weren't too disturbed by that. Okay. Uh, I'm more disturbed by hearing how much we have to talk about that night. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that it sounds like this is not going to be a difficult vote on the zoning amendment and the map for whoever is eligible to vote. I mean, that's, that's my sense. I mean, we haven't gotten very many 
comments at all, none, none particularly negative and none from the public. So. So why don't we say the flood maps come back at 735 on the 21st? Okay. And I won't give my introductory speech that night. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, let's see, we need a motion to continue Do we, are we continuing both hearings, correct? Yeah, so we're continuing the, so maybe I'll try to sound out a motion here and I'll just make it. Um, so uh, I move that we uh, continue this public hearing for the zoning bylaw for article two, article three and article 16 all related to FEMA floodplain overlay district and the hearing for the FEMA floodplain overlay district maps, uh, all continued to September 21st at 7.35 PM. Chris, does that sound plausible? I'm seeing you nod your head. Okay, good. I'm muted, sorry. Yes. Good, so I already have a hand from Johanna. I'll second the motion. Thank you, Johanna. Maybe, maybe next time, Tom. <laughs> um, so any conversation by the board on that motion? No. All right, so in that case, why don't we run through the roll? Uh, Bruce. Uh, I, I can vote yes for that. Yeah. All right. Uh, Tom. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Janet. Aye. Johanna. Aye. Karen. Aye. And I'm an aye as well. All right. So we'll continue that hearing. Thank you all. All right, so we'll now move on to item four on our agenda. These are special public, special permit public hearings. Uh, the first one is with SPP 2022-04 Amherst Office Park LLC at 463 West Street. Request to reopen the public hearing for this application for the purpose of voting on a request to withdraw without prejudice. The original approval of the special permit to extinguish previous special permits, ZBA FY84-0085, ZBA FY85-0094, did not have a sufficient number of board members voting. Map 19D, parcel three in the BVC zoning district. All right, so Chris, do you want to take these one at a time, I assume? That would be a good idea, yeah. Okay. Do you want me so, to explain anything? Yeah, so we've now reopened this public hearing. Um, yeah, need, Chris, why don't, why don't you- We need to vote to reopen the public hearing. All right. Uh, so board members, is there any, do I need a motion? Yes. All right. I so yeah. move. <laughs> I so I move to reopen the public hearing. Okay, Janet, and I see Johanna's hand again. She just beat Tom. It's like Jeopardy. I second the motion. Okay, thank you. All right, so board members, why don't we vote on that? Uh, Bruce, you all right with opening reopening this public hearing? Yes. Uh, Tom. Aye. And Andrew. Aye. And Janet. Aye. Johanna. Aye. And Karen. Aye. And I am an aye as well. That's seven in favor to reopen this public hearing. Chris, is this going to be a topic that we that we cannot all vote on again? I think you cannot all vote on it. Five of you can vote on it. Um, 
Okay. And I think that you should read a truncated version of the um, preamble, which I believe that Pam has prepared. All right. Can you, can you just read the project description? Well, I think- Well, I've, I've got it, I've got it here, Pam. Yeah. I've got what you wrote at least. Yeah. Okay. okay, so in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, this joint public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPP 2022-04 Amherst Office Park, LLC, 463 West Street. And I, I, I have already read the text that you've had for that. And then there was SPP 2023-03. This is a new public hearing. Amherst think, Office Park LLC. Off, excuse me, why don't you hold off on that one and finish the first one and then go back okay. and do the second one. All right, so um, I have now read that. We have voted to reopen the hearing. The hearing is open and Chris, why don't you explain what we're doing uh, Okay, so it's an error on the part of planning staff and I will fess up to this. Um, when you held the public hearing on June 15th, there were only four planning board members uh, present and you voted to um, grant a, special, a site plan review approval to um, Amherst Office Park LLC. And at the same time you voted to grant this special permit to allow the extinguishing of previous special permits. But it turned out that you didn't have sufficient number of planning board members present to vote on the special permit. So I only found that out after the public hearing was closed. It, I realized it, I should say. Um, and so we are asking you back tonight to reopen the public hearing. Mr. Um, Lavertier has submitted a request for um, to withdraw that, um, that application. And I think you have that in your packets. Um, it was on his letterhead. And so if you would approve his request to withdraw, then you could close this public hearing for the first um, item here. And, 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 and at that point, we will have a second hearing where we consider the same request. Yes, that's correct. And I think you would then open that public hearing and consider that same request and then vote on that. Okay. I think you should vote on this one first. All right. And I'm, I'm going to leave, leave it to your good judgment on why we, we, we can't just have more than five votes on the current public hearing. Oh, you could have more than five. You could have five votes on the current. But I mean, could have seven votes. It on seems the like it's the hearing. same request in the, the, the but two. It's a new request. Hearing. It's newly um, requested since July 1st, and the new planning board members have been members since July 1st, so they all, they are eligible. Oh, so that's it. the reason for closing. Yes. For, for initiating a new public hearing. That's is, correct. Is yes. to allow everyone to vote on it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And so the people who can vote on closing or on allowing it to be withdrawn are the people who were previously on the board only, yes. only. Any, anyone who was previously on the board even those who weren't there okay. that night okay so is that clear to everyone <laughs> um so so i think we're gonna we're gonna need a motion to accept the request to withdraw without prejudice, right? Yes. Okay. Tom, you, you got there first. So moved. Okay. Chris, have you heard enough to call to say we have a motion? Yes, I have. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Andrew. Second. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. So um, we're we're gonna have five members who are eligible to vote. Chris, you're saying we need five votes. Mm, yep, I think so. All right, mm -hmm. so uh, Bruce and Karen, you can sit back on this one. 
Um, any discussion? Any discussion from the public? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands anywhere. All right, so to withdraw without prejudice. Tom. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Janet. Aye. Johanna. Aye. And I'm an I as well. And, and to close the public hearing. All right, so. You now, can roll that into the motion if you wanted to, that you already made. All right, so Tom, that's a friendly amendment. I, I move to close the public hearing. All right, and I'll, I'll go ahead and second that if we want to consider it a second motion or not. All right, um, I, I assume we could all vote on that, Chris. Yeah, I, um, I think, why don't you just stick to the five? Yeah. Okay. Be safer. Keeps all it right. clean. And uh, so that'll be Tom. Aye. And Andrew. Aye. And Janet. Aye. Johanna. Aye. And I'm an I as well. So we have now closed public hearing SPP 2022-04. And we have allowed the applicant to withdraw without prejudice. Thank you. All right, so now on to our next and our new public hearing. In accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, this joint, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPP 2023-03, Amherst Office Park, LLC, 463 West Street, new request for special permit to extinguish previous special permits, ZBA FY84-00085 and ZBA FY85-00094, as zoning has changed and mixed use building buildings are currently permitted by site plan review. Map 19D, parcel three in the BVC zoning district. Is there any board member disclosure? I do not see any hands. All right, Chris, you are you presenting on behalf of the applicant? I'm going to, I can present. The applicant is not here tonight. We did invite him, but he, um, uh, you know, right. didn't really want to come again. So anyway, the um, two uh, special permits that are asked to be extinguished were included in your packets. So I presume you've had a chance to read them. Um, and they had to do with, as we said before, a previous uh, zoning situation. And now the zoning has changed to BVC and mixed use buildings are currently allowed in BVC by site plan review. So there's no longer a need for the special permits. If we were to keep them in place, then um, we would have to be worried about the conditions of those special permits. And I think um, I also included the decision for site plan review um, that was part of this an original uh, public hearing, which um, uh, talked about the fact that the conditions of those previous special permits weren't really needed anymore. I think that was a specific question that was asked by one of the planning board members. So um, we feel that we can reasonably extinguish these two ZBA special permits without any um, flaw in the, in the proceedings and in enforcement. Okay. All right, um, board members, are there questions about this application? All right, I'm not seeing any raised hands. Uh, how about members of the public? Are there any members of the public who want to comment on this application to extinguish the previous special permits? Not seeing any hands there either. Uh, especially new board members, Bruce and Karen, you're okay with going ahead with a vote? I'm seeing heads nodding. 
Bruce, there, I see your hand. Yes, I was just going to say yes. In fact, uh, as an attendee uh, in the public side of the thing, I did actually attend the previous uh, meeting, so I'm somewhat familiar. Plus, okay. uh, 20 years ago, I was probably, I recall, part of the original permits. So, okay. yeah, I'm fine. All right, great. Okay, um, so let's see, we need a motion. Tom, do you want me to just start with you this time? Uh, we need a motion to uh, accept the applicant's request to extinguish the previous special permits. Tom. So moved. All right. Um, Chris, would you like us to close, have a motion to close the hearing at the same time? That would be lovely. Okay. So Tom, can you accept that I'm as a... Yes, I move to also close the hearing as well. All right. Thank you. Tom, uh, Andrew. I will second that motion. All right. Thank you. Okay, uh, I don't see any more hands for any discussion, so we'll go right on into it. And all seven members may vote. Bruce. I vote aye. Tom. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Janet. Aye. Johanna. Aye. And Karen. Aye. And I'm an aye as well. All right, so we extinguish and we close. All right, great. So that was item four on our agenda. It's just about eight o'clock and we normally take a five minute break at eight o'clock. So why don't we do that now? Uh, the time now is 7.59. Why don't you come back when you're, you see 8.05 on your clocks? So we'll take a six minute break. Please turn off your cameras and make sure you're muted.
Okay, I'm seeing uh, 8.06 on my computer clock. So board members, if you are there, you can turn on your cameras and let, let us know you are back in the vicinity. Looks like we have everyone except for Andrew and Johanna. And uh, Doug, may I ask um, Pam to move Bruce yeah. Allen into the panelists? Okay. And, and also Chris Chamberlain. Oh, good. And there's Rob, too. Rob Mora, where is he? He just came into the, uh, the panel. Oh, good. There he is. Um, and if I could ask for Doug Serrell, who's uh, with our office, to be admitted to. OK. And I don't see Andrew yet. Did everybody make it? No, we, we're still missing Andrew McDougall. But we do have all the applicants, attendees, or uh, representatives. There's Andrew. All right. OK, so we're all back. Uh, the time is 8.08. .08, and uh, I need to do another intro for another hearing this evening. Okay, so in, a, in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law 40, Chapter 40A, this joint public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPP 2023-02, Bruce Allen, 51 Spalding Street public hearing to request a special permit to modify ZBA FY 20 or 2007-00030 and allow three roomers with an owner occupied dwelling unit within an owner occupied dwelling unit construct five parking spaces previously approved and construct two parking spaces within the front setback in the northwest corner of the parcel and relocate an existing shade tree within the front setback under sections 3.3210, 5.0100, and 7.000 of the zoning bylaw, map 14B, parcel 110 in the RG zoning district. First, are there any board members' disclosures? I do not see any hands with disclosure. OK, um, Chris, do you want to say anything before we turn it over to the applicant? I can, I can say a few words about the project, and then um, maybe Rob Mora may want to say a couple of sentences on it, too. Um, so this is a project that's been around for a while. Um, the original permits were granted, um, permit was granted in 2007, FY 2007, to allow um, the single family house to be turned into a two family house. Um, the way the house was actually built um, is different from the exact layout that was approved in 2007. And um, the number of parking spaces that were 
going to be built as a result of that special permit um, were not built. So um, over the years, there have been a number of issues. Um, neighbors have complained about the parking issue and have um, raised issues about you know how many people are living in the house. And um, in the past few years, the applicant has um, taken in borders, um, which under normal circumstances would be allowed by right. But since this is a two family house and the two family house, when it was originally permitted by the special permit by the Zoning Board of Appeals, um, did not include the idea of, um, of having borders. So the planning board is being asked to approve the um, change to the special, the original special permit to allow um, these borders to be there. Um, the applicant is asking for three rumors, uh, they're calling it. Um, the uh, applicant is also, or we, we are asking the planning board to acknowledge the new layout of the interior spaces in the house, which are um, rendered um, accurately via uh, as-built drawings that have been prepared by the architect, Laura Fitch. And um, we're also asking the planning board to approve uh, um, parking spaces that are uh, being proposed. There are five parking spaces behind the house that are being proposed and two, two parking spaces in the front uh, setback. Um, the number of parking spaces is of course based on the number of dwelling units and um, the applicant has the ability to uh, negotiate with the board about exactly how many parking spaces would be required. Since there are two dwelling units, there's a, um, the main dwelling unit and there's an accessory dwelling unit in the basement. Um, there would be uh, typically two parking spaces required for each of those dwelling units. And then if the applicant is going to be allowed to have three roomers, there would be a requirement for one parking space for each of those rumors. So that would be a total of seven parking spaces required if the applicant is allowed to have um, the three rumors. So, but those, the seven parking spaces, as I said, is an open for negotiation under the new uh, zoning bylaw. Um, so I think that's all I have to say, except I did wanna make a mention of the fact that um, before the current uh, people on this, uh, meeting became involved in this project. Um, there was a CFO, a certificate of occupancy granted for this project um, without having things built according to the plan. So that was um, in, in error that happened back then. We don't really know how it happened. And um, so now we're trying to rectify that. So um, I don't know if Rob Mora has anything to add to my uh, explanation and then um, maybe Bruce Allen would like to present the project. Rob, you're shaking your head, so you don't need to say anything. Huh? Okay. Okay, Mr. Allen, uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, and I, actually, I think I'm, I'll be taking the lead um, on this, okay. but certainly um, Bruce and Carol can chime in if we have questions that, that they can better answer. Um, I'm Chris Chamberlain, civil engineer from Berkshire Design Group. Uh, that have been helping Bruce and Carol to um, get these permit plans and permit application together and in. Um, I had prepared some notes on discussing the background of this project, but Chris did a better job than I would have. So um, uh, I, I think that 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 uh, timeline and understanding is pretty clear. And I think that the key word that uh, she used just toward the end there was to was that this uh, proposal is to rectify um, so what are essentially existing conditions now with permit approvals, and then also to um, acknowledge that um, as part of this property uh, where the use uh, was originally approved and uh, where these rumors have been added that are typically allowed by right, uh, there are requirements for a certain uh, minimum parking set by zoning, which uh, you know were not built when they should have been. Um, and so now this plan proposes to add sufficient parking spaces to bring the site uh, within conformance with zoning. Um, uh, another complicating factor was the fact that in 2007, 
Uh, that approved plan went to the Conservation Commission, was approved at that time, but those permits expire after three years. So we've also brought this plan back to the Conservation Commission and received an order of conditions to build it in the buffer zone of uh, boarding vegetated wetland. Um, so then um, what I will do is uh, share the project plans and um, this is actually going to be pretty straightforward because there are only a couple of things to highlight on this plan. Um, so this is the existing property on Spalding Street, uh, north being up on this plan. Um, and uh, here is the house as it exists today. Um, uh, Multi-story uh, house with a deck area and a paved driveway in this location here. Um, and to just sort of clarify some of that layout, and this was discussed at the site plan, um, there is the, the sort of main owner-occupied house is the majority of this building. Uh, and uh, within that um, sort of owner-occupied portion of the house is where uh, Bruce and Carol live. Um, and uh, associated with that are the potential, are, are the three potential rooms to rent. Um, two of them are within the house proper. And then there is a third one that's associated with the owner-occupied portion of the building that exists on the basement level of this portion of the house with a separate exterior entrance. Um, that's led to a little bit of confusion about the definition of our room to rent and its association with the owner-occupied portion of the house. So sort of uh, some of the other members that were there at the site visit uh, can attest to these facts, but uh, the exit from this room uh, leads uh, with actually a nice covered uh, walkway into either the main level of the house or more conveniently a uh, basement level access that then gives them uh, access to the house um, and most importantly for kitchen because the, the room to rent by definition can't have a kitchen in it. Um, so that room has access there. And then um, on the basement level of this house in roughly this location here, is the second um, uh, full residence. Uh, I think it was referred to as an accessory, but I think technically that's a slightly different definition than what we're talking about here because this is not an accessory unit, but uh, the second unit of a duplex. So that's the existing site plan. And then flipping to the proposed, uh, there are no architectural changes proposed whatsoever. Um, what is proposed for site work is to add on to the end of this existing driveway, a, an area of gravel here with five parking spaces in a row, um, four of them full size nine by 18 and another uh, slightly narrow water one as the zoning allows for compact parking space uh, with new gravel surface. Um, in order to screen that area, uh, we have, and uh, to screen the area and create additional vegetated buffer, to the wetlands to the east, uh, there's a proposal for a row of plantings, including uh, rhododendrons, and um, uh, I think these are red osier dogwoods, and Doug is going to correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, and then the sixth and seventh spaces coming um, off of the street uh, located in this area here uh, with a new curb cut in the right of way, but the uh, space is entirely uh, within the private property. Um, and then part of the application is that this tree, which is a shade tree, uh, relatively young still at this point and not terribly big, is to move this uh, about five feet to the south to make a little bit more room for this gravel parking pad, uh, which is something that's previously been discussed with the tree warden uh, who has no problem with it and in fact offered to help. Um, and, uh, you know, addition to that, erosion controls is required by wetlands protection. Um, and then there are um, floodlights on the house, um, and we've submitted materials that those uh, are proposed to be shielded to ensure that there's no light spill off the property. Um, but those are here to provide just safety lighting uh, for these parking spaces uh, to access back and forth. Um, and that is the extent to what we're doing. Again, to sort of summarize is we want to rectify the as-built architectural condition of the house with the approval that's on file, um, and then to uh, provide the uh, minimum parking uh, spaces required by zoning. Um, uh, 
And you know, as, as Chris mentioned, uh, you know, there's the potential for uh, negotiation over parking spaces. On most of the projects we work, work on, that's typically trying to reduce the number of parking spaces below the uh, what's required, uh, but that's not uh, being proposed here by the owners. They, they want to provide the, the seven that are required for the uh, two duplex units and the three potential allowed rooms for rent. And I'll leave this up. Uh, maybe. Okay, thank you, Chris. Chris Prestrup, I see your hand. So I just wanted to clarify also, and I think I mentioned this before, that um, the other question is that's before you is, um, since this was a duplex that was approved by a special permit, and the idea of rumors was not considered under that special permit, the planning board also um, would need to amend that previous special permit to allow rumors, even though rumors are ordinarily allowed in a single family house that doesn't have a special permit. In this case, it needs the blessing of the planning board to have those rumors there. Thank you. Okay. All right. So I know several board members came on, went on a site visit. Uh, and uh, I wondered if someone who was there yesterday would be willing to give a description of what they saw. Um, I'm not seeing any hands from one of the people who came by, went, went to the site yesterday. Okay, Tom and Karen, why, why don't you start Tom and then Karen, you can fill in the blanks. Sure, no problem. So, um, so when we arrived at the site, we were actually at the um, the street edge, at the edge of the driveway, and um, we were able to see uh, and locate where the two parking spots were. Um, I guess that's to the north. Is that correct, or that that's to the? Yes, this is to the north. Yeah, um, the six and seven, and and we discussed the movement of the tree. Um, which seems very small and doable in terms of moving and not too complicated, um, which was um, easy to visualize with uh, Chris's guidance. Um, and then we moved uh, down through the driveway and explored the ex extension of that driveway and the area around there. Um, we talked about the wetlands. We talked about where those spaces would be located. We talked about the boundary area uh, on is this is north um, on the bottom here, or am I? Uh, so, so north is up on this plan. North is up, okay. So south, um, we, the boundary line on the south that was actually confirmed over the last few weeks um, to make sure we had some space there. Um, we talked about plantings, we talked about wetlands, um, but mainly um, we were looking back at the house from that location. There was a lot of discussion about what's actually happening on the interior of that house. Um, and we were able to look inside to the, um, the um, rented space that is a single person dwelling without a, um, without a kitchen um, on that first floor. And we were able to look inside and, and um, qualify that that is actually just a, a bedroom um, with a bathroom. Um, in that space, we were talking about entry and exit from that space, entry and exit to the duplex apartment um, that occurs underneath the deck as well. We also talked about bike storage and lots of, of other things as well. Um, but we really did get a lay of the land um, from Chris um, and from the, um, the current residents and kind of you know, from that perspective really understood how the property worked and um, who has access to what portion of the space and from where. Um, so it's, it's really informative to see uh, on site, I think that you wouldn't necessarily see in a, in a site plan um, or the description we have here. All right, thanks, Tom. Karen, you wanna add anything to that? I think that was a pretty complete. Um, I do see that this is going to be a gravel uh, parking space and I do know that that is a problem with snow plowing and, and I know the owners mentioned that too. Um, so in the winter time, when you're gonna plow gravel, it's, that's difficult. Mm -hmm. I, I see this as a, really a problem of zoning. Um, the neighbors 
have complained about parking and it's just, it's a shame this whole backyard, which is beautiful in front of the wetlands is going to be gravel now because of the requirement of having uh, parking for each, is it two places or just enough parking for these rumors and our town, which is trying to densify uh, and have um, owner occupied uh, is what we're really aiming for because the, the complaints I think on this particular um, house have only been on parking. It, it, you know, when the owners are there, you don't have the loud part, you, you don't, the, the house is maintained. Um, so I, I see that this is a dilemma that people that want to take in uh, students and enjoy it, and it seems like a good situation for the students are going to have to take their whole property and turn it into a gravel parking place. But that seems to be what's happening here. And um, yeah, so. All right. So, feelings. All right. Thank you, Karen. Um, Bruce. Um, I too was uh, kind of uh, overwhelmed by the proposition that the whole of the backyard. So we saw that and we saw just what a. Um, a complete uh, takeover of the rear yard uh, was proposed by this, uh, and that was instructive for me. The other thing I need to add, I think, uh, Doug, is that the Spalding Street, uh, it's worth noting, is, uh, well, it's a dead end shortly uh, further up the street, but it's very narrow, and, uh, and there, the verges on either side are often quite difficult, particularly at this end where it's starting to go up the hill. Um, so uh, parking on the on the street looks awkward to begin with because uh, the uh, it's so narrow and the verges so it's it slopes off on the uh, on the right hand side downward and on the left hand side uh, often uh, the grade goes up fairly steeply so it's the, the street itself is uh, when you park on the street it uh, you certainly notice a vehicle is there and uh, to some degree it it it, uh, it looks as though it's uh, an imposition in the landscape at least that was my impression i think okay. that's it thank you bruce and and i will repeat i guess what uh, i think we've heard from chris which is that you know we're being asked whether to allow this property to have the three borders and we're being asked to decide what is an appropriate number of parking spaces for however many occupants we are allowing in the house. So, you know, if, if we decide, gee, we really don't wanna have the backyard full of gravel and that there ought to be fewer parking spaces, that could influence the number of occupants in the house, uh, just, and, and vice versa, so. Um, Tom, why don't you go ahead? Sure, I just had one other comment, which was um, that it, it seems like there's a lot of discussion and debate about parking on the street and the visibility of cars. Um, and, and while I agree with Bruce and, and Karen about the, the, the parking issue, basically just wiping out this, what I think is a really lovely lawn, and also removes the cars well from the street and buries them actually behind the house um, in, in a way that really removes them from the street. So I think it, it's an opportunity to minimize complaints from the neighbors as well by really taking those cars out of the right of way and out of visibility. So, so there's that aspect of it, I think, from a, from a functional perspective that, that I noticed standing at the end of the driveway, you, you wouldn't see much of um much of the parking area um or at least much of the cars because of the plant things that are currently there mm -hmm. okay janet um i have some questions for the site visitors um because i when i look at bedroom six i'm sort of perplexed by why there's a, a extra sink there did you see any facilities for storing food or cooking um and then i i don't really understand from this, I mean, maybe if we can look at um, the existing condition basement plan. Um, I didn't really understand how the person in 
bedroom six got into the house. And I began to wonder, was that person really living in the house or occasionally a visitor, but really living separately from the people in you know, the household with the rumors? And so if you can go to that as built and you know, did you see cooking facilities or food storage facilities in bedroom six? And then literally, how does this person get into the house? Do they have to go you know, through under a deck into the basement up those stairs? Is there another access point? Like, okay. do they have to go outside? All right. Um, before we go to the site visitors and for their observations on the on bedroom six, um, Rob, would you mind, since you've toured the house as well, would you mind giving us your interpretation of bedroom six and its cooking facilities and what that means or, you know, for the, for the uh, category that that space should occupy in our minds? Sure. Uh, so we rely on definitions of the state sanitary code for this purpose, and it's something that we deal with quite often, as you can imagine. But, um, you know, the, the unit doesn't have a complete kitchen, and to have a complete kitchen, it does need to have a oven and, and cooktop. Uh, this unit doesn't have it. Uh, it does have a, a fridge, a sink, a small fridge, a sink, uh, and that counter space uh, that you can see there in the picture right inside the doorway. Uh, but it doesn't have the full um, the full kitchen that would make it a, a dwelling unit by definition. So unfortunately, we're not, you know, we're not able to even consider it a dwelling unit uh, for that uh, reason and for another reason that it only has one exit. So uh, this particular space really has no choice but to either a room, be a rooming unit or some other purpose, but not a complete dwelling unit. Um, to answer part of the question uh, from my tour of the building, uh, the, the occupants of building uh, bedroom six can enter at the lower level uh, through the doorway, uh, primarily to have access to a shared laundry facility that is there uh, in the corner of the, the lower level, uh, and then uh, uh, travel up the stairs and be right inside the, the main kitchen of the home. Uh, and that's, that's the tour I took in the opposite direction when I was traveling through, through the house. Okay, thank you. So now, uh, Bruce and Karen, I think you, uh, Janet's question was directed toward you guys who were part of the site visit and how you, uh, what your reaction was to bedroom six. Um, I could start, I think. Uh, uh, I poked my head in the door. Uh, the person who just, uh, uh, who lives there, uh, uh, had just moved in and, and I guess we felt a little bit intrusive, but you can see, as you can see, uh, uh, once the door is opened wide, you can pretty much see everything. The counter uh, and so forth exactly as Rob describes has a sink where you can see it and at the uh, left hand end under the counter there's a small refrigerator and on the counter there is a microwave or a toaster oven or something. So it's a, it's, it has food preparation capability, but uh, it doesn't rise to the uh, Level, I think there was a, uh, it was a, a, during COVID, I think the occupant, as I understood it, of that room had purchased a small freezer that was stored in the storage area there um, that gave them complete, uh, uh, more or less complete uh, independence because they, they could take a frozen meal and heat it up and so forth. Um, the, the, the owners did advise that the, the way in which this room was often used uh, in, in the in the in the short life of its existence, I suppose, has been that the uh, the person will take the room and often uh, a student, the university student, and often uh, take their meals at the university dining commons, even though the room has uh, kitchen privilege, as I understand it upstairs. But it's it's it it tends to be used by students who um, uh, might even shower and, and dine and so forth at the university. I, uh, I guess I should add uh, that in conversation with the owners, it, it's um, uh, the, 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 the owners seem to be the, of, a, of, a, of a type of person who likes to have students and likes to live with students and, and likes to make friends at, uh, you know, and have over the years of having them in their house, uh, uh, some of them become, uh, so there's a relationship building thing. It's quite, it seems to be, um, 
uh, understandable and, and natural. I have other friends in town that uh, have uh, aspired to these kind of uh, rental arrangements uh, for the same reasons. Um, but it's it's not a typical way of uh, accommodating students, I don't think, uh, uh, because usually they 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 are in a separate part of the house. And I, I would like I have to say I didn't see this drawing and and or any of the drawings of the building and I I they weren't in the packet and and I so this is the first time I've seen it and it was going to be a question of mine how can we validate the uh, as built uh, um, if we haven't seen them um, so I, I I want to ask whether I'm alone in not having seen these before okay Bruce uh, I can tell you I saw them. I saw them in the packet that was mailed to me, and I believe I saw them in the PDF that was emailed out on Friday. Um, and uh, I guess others, if, if you did not see it in your packet, please raise your hand. Um, Karen, why don't you go ahead and comment? I think everything has been said. Um, I actually, I think if I were a student, this would be a very desirable place, a very welcoming host family. And uh, I, I liked everything about it, except the fact that the whole yard is going to be turned into gravel. And in the front, there are those two things. I, I just wish we had a way of, um, of being able to rent to students and requiring them not to have automobiles that would solve this. So. That's my only dilemma. I, um, well, Karen, I mean, if you wanted, you could propose that we accept, you know, the floor plans as built, but we not require seven parking spaces. There, if you wanted to propose that, you could do that. So you can, just, you can you can think about that. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering how realistic that is, and whether that is going to put the onus again on the. Uh, parking in this narrow street and exactly what the neighbors are complaining about the fact that all of a sudden you have this influx of automobiles and I do understand that so it's it's a dilemma yeah okay thank you uh Andrew thanks Doug <clears throat> um yeah, I, I had questions about bedroom six as well I mean was reading through some of the letters from the neighbors and the neighbors seem to the letters we got like didn't seem to have a very positive opinion of what was happening here and I you know I'd love to maybe get a sense from from Bruce maybe what could be driving that um it does seem as though um well I guess do, do does a resident of bedroom six typically prepare their meals like are they using the house commonly or um do do they essentially just sort of exist on their own as if this were like its own apartment? Uh, uh, Mr. Allen, uh, would you be willing to respond to that or? Okay, she'll answer that. I'll answer it. <laughs> Hi. Um, in room six, uh, right now, the person actually takes the majority of the meals except for breakfast over at UMass. However, I have had people over the years who would just, um, you know, they are totally fine just having uh, the microwave and, you know, a, a toaster oven basically. And they're, you know, they eat a lot of their meals. A lot of my grad students, they eat a lot of their meals at UMass. And then they come over and they, they make meals. It's fine, but you know, they're happy with the arrangement. They're very happy with the arrangement. They know they can come upstairs if they want to make something, if they want to make cookies and bring them in, they're welcome to. They can come right upstairs unimpeded. Um, it's not a problem whatsoever. And uh, I will tell you, people have been comfortable, absolutely comfortable back there. Um, and they, you know, they don't have to really it's covered area so they don't it, it's never been a problem for the for the person in bedroom six they like it actually it's a wonderful bedroom it's got heated tile floors uh a lot of windows they've been happy there great place to study good internet they're they're pretty thrilled 
But one yes. thing I wanted to say, though, that uh, Bruce had mentioned about the freezer that is in the uh, storage okay. area, uh, that was actually for the elderly woman, the women that lived in the efficiency apartment. Uh, at that time when COVID hit, uh, our, we have a, a tenant who's been there for 10 years. She's probably in her early 50s. Uh, she works from home there. Uh, but she had a 70-year-old friend move in at the beginning of COVID uh, because they were both deathly afraid of COVID. And that's when the freezer showed up. And we never saw them for a year and a half. Yeah. <laughs> so they stayed in it. And now the, the, the older woman has since moved out. So now it's just the, the younger woman who is probably early 50s now is in there. She's been a long-term tenant of ours. So we, we only have the one person in the efficiency apartment. Yeah. I just thought I'd clarify that. Yeah, that's her freezer. That, that has nothing to do with any of the rest of us. Great. Um, can I also ask um, what... What other two bedrooms would typically be occupied by these three boarders? Uh, typically on the second floor, uh, if you go to the other plan, uh, go to uh, the, yeah. um, okay. the upstairs. So bedroom one is uh, actually what we used to call the master bedroom. Uh, that's basically where we've always stayed. It's still set up as our master bedroom. I mean, pretty much all of my clothes are in there. Uh, we got married in 2016, and that's when I moved into the house. Uh, that was the only place I had a room to put my clothes. And so uh, Carol and I have since moved downstairs on the, on the first floor to be in the bedroom five because it's all on one floor of living. So bedroom one is we set aside for when her kids come to visit or if guests come to visit. Normally, what we rent out is bedroom two and bedroom three. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Andrew, did you have further? Yeah, I, I get just a couple. Like, uh, you know, again, I think some of the concerns from from the neighbors, and I, I understand there's like legal definition of what makes it a living space. But if you've got a microwave, you've got you know a fridge, you've got a toaster oven. I mean, you've got a hot plate, and like you're a fully functioning apartment. Um, and so I, I understand that like there's a legal definition. I don't want to get into that that point, but um, it did. You know, I was hearing that there there's some concern that this is just a way to circumvent um, zoning and essentially create a, a freestanding apartment. Um, and again, if there if if you can live in there without ever having to come upstairs and be fully self sufficient, it would certainly kind of seem like that would be the case. Um, I did have a question about the parking as well, um, which was if we go back to that for a second is. It looked like we had the existing grading. What is the future grading? It looks like there's a pretty, pretty good drop there, uh, five six feet over the course of that. What is the plan? Um, is there a plan to use like retaining structure or something, or is this going? Does does this just kind of naturally continue to follow the existing grading lines? Yeah, uh, it it pretty much follows existing. Uh, I mean, this uh, from this contour, which is two twenty two. Um, to the corner here, 219. I mean, that's a three foot drop over 50 to 60 feet. Um, and so, you know, there may need to be a little bit of accommodation right on this corner where it starts to drop off a little bit. Um, but uh, I think certainly standing out there, it doesn't feel too steep um, in any particular direction. There is a steep drop off on the southern property line. Um, and so um, there's, there, uh, no ability to sort of push things in that direction. Um, somewhat coincident near the property line, you can see where it starts to really drop off there. So um, there, there is that that potential there. Um, but in this main part of the site, uh, it's relatively flat. Uh, Chris, on on that topic, in some of the photos and some of the correspondence, it sounded like there had been some parking on the south side of the driveway over the years. And, you know, there was, there was contention about whether that was over the property line or not. And I gather it's now been figured out that that's really not over the property line, but is there a plan for there to be sort of guest parking in along the, the driveway or is there never gonna be more parking along the driveway? 
Um, so I can answer that part of that question. I may defer to Bruce and Carol, um, but there is sort of a currently worn patch in this area here off of the driveway. Um, I suspect as a consequence of not having um, this sort of formal parking created, um, there was, this was in part um, our fault um, in publishing the first version of the plan. You know, we talked early on, uh, this project was really focused on the Conservation Commission permitting. Um, and so at that time, the exact location of this south boundary wasn't terribly material because what we were looking to permit was disturbances within the buffer zone. Um, and so uh, just by importing the tax map property lines from GIS, uh, they showed this boundary being a good bit north of where it is and actually intersected with a portion of the paved driveway and probably also some of that uh, informal space that's used here. So based on our original plan that we started with conservation with, it did look like there was some encroachment off the property, which you see here today, which we resubmitted last week um, after all of the survey work was done, is the surveyed property line uh, with an accurate depiction. And just for reference, you know, this line that you see traced here is the 10 foot zoning setbacks so that gives you an, an idea of how much breathing room we have there. Okay, so I guess the gist of that is that there is no expectation that there would be parking along the driveway once the parking lot is constructed in, in the rear of the property. That's correct. Okay, thank you. I, and, and then just my final thing was just, what is the snow removal plan? And maybe we'll get to that shortly, but um, knowing, I mean, again, maybe so the parking could be flat. It does drop off as you go off. What What's what's the, uh, the proposal? Um, yeah, Chris? I think Bruce is best to answer that, um, but I think a, a, the key point of it is, is that they do the snow removal with snow blowers and shovels typically, um, as opposed to a, a plow, which would have a little bit more difficulty finding some of the, the green space that's outside of the 25 foot buffer, which is the one uh, condition that CONSCOM um, imposed was that um, beyond this 25 foot buffer, they don't wanna see snow storage. Okay. So uh, I, I, I am the person that runs the snowblower. Uh, we also have a person that can plow if, if we happen to not be able to, or we're like out of town or something like that. Uh, yeah. But, oh. You're mute. No, I'm not No, nope, nope. we can hear you. Oh, you can, okay. So, uh, so the situation is, uh, I, I've been snow plowing this driveway for over 10 years. The, as anyone, as, as the uh, people were there yesterday, the, the paved part of the driveway, drops off kind of steeply, but once you get down to the gravel area, uh, someone has told me it's basically, a, I think a 3% grade. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, the other issue is, is that uh, I have uh, probably for 20 years, I had a huge gravel parking area in Connecticut that I routinely had to run the snowblower over. So I have a lot of experience with running the snowblower over loose gravel it's fairly simple. You, you got to lift the front of the blower up so you don't pick up the rocks. It's uh, fairly straightforward. It's not a big deal. The uh, situation though is, is that uh, the snow removal plan is to basically uh, blow the snow to the south side uh, to, to just the northern part of the southern property line and put it down there. And then also uh, up there where you see the number the 29 foot to the 45 foot that that area there, we cannot we cannot really push the snow down straight down the driveway because then we would be into the uh, 25 foot buffer, uh, and that that was uh, a thing which we're excluded to do in the wetland uh, uh, condition or order, order of conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, same for the front portion there. Uh, that's fairly straightforward. Uh, I routinely uh, run a snowblower around the walkways that go you know, out to that area, uh, and it's not a real issue. Um, uh, so, uh, Chris, uh, I assume that the, the conditions we impose and the plan that's approved uh, will be applicable even if the property changes hands. Is that correct? Which Chris are you asking? I'm asking you, Chris Prescott. 
Yes, the permit will go with the land. Okay, so so Mr. Allen has a great deal of expertise blow, uh, you know, snow blowing on gravel, but the next owner may not. So, uh, or and they may not, they may plow rather than, you know. Well, I, I would like to comment one thing, and that is, is that uh, we probably all noticed there are plenty of gravel driveways in this town and very large gravel parking areas. So this situation is not unique. In fact, many of them are, are right off the Spalding Street. So um, it, it's not a unique situation. Okay, great. All right, uh, Chris Chamberlain, I, your hand is still up. Did I did that, it was up from a little while ago, but I did just want to um, just uh, summarize a couple of things. Um, I think that um, it's good. Uh, the conversation about sort of how the house operates is, is a good one and um, important to understanding how this property is going to be. Um, but when we're talking about decision making and in terms of how the zoning bylaw applies, I would just say that that the legal definition is really important there, um, and uh, and that absent uh, definition in the zoning bylaw, which could be added, that more specifically defines uh, what that uh, border is, and maybe there is, and I, I don't, I, I'm I'm not familiar with all, however many hundred pages, um, that uh, you know, deferring to that um, sort of state code um, basis for making that determination is, is really all, all that we can do, I think. Um, and then, you know, the other thing is that that this is a little bit of an unusual situation because a special permit already existed on this site. Uh, but if I'm not mistaken, under current zoning, if this were a brand new duplex conversion coming in, uh, in this zone, that conversion would be allowed by right with site plan review, um, but not a special permit. Um, and then the, the provisions that allow the, the rumors, um, you know, it doesn't make a distinction between uh, single family versus duplex. It talks about owner occupied residences having rooms associated with them. So I think that's important context that while because of, you know, the, the existence of the special permit, we're looking for an amendment. There's sort of a, an alternate route where that special permit, uh, you know, gets vacated through one way or another, and this comes back as site plan review, um, and then those those rooms to rent sort of, I believe, would just be uh, under the purview of the building department. So, uh, again, I want to say that, that nothing wrong with the discussion. I think it's helpful to, to understand, but I think that context is important, and it's certainly, if Chris Bestrup wants to correct me on any of that, she, she certainly should. Okay, thank you, Chris. Chamberlain, Chris Brestrup, did you want to comment on that at all? I would prefer to have Rob Mora comment if any comments are going to be made about the okay. interpretation of the zoning bylaw. All right, Rob, uh, you want to say anything or shall we let Chris's statement stand? Well, I, I think most of the statement is fine. I think it's important to know that, um, you know, when the bylaw does change like it did in this situation, an existing special permit does not automatically disappear and it still controls the property. And, and this board has experience extinguishing those special permits as they have in other cases as a way to eliminate that and allow some other development to occur by maybe a different permitting path. But um, the, the special permit exists and has meaning even when the bylaw does change uh, in the future. Okay, thank you, Rob. Um, Janet. So, you know, when I read through this packet and the and the um, complaints by the abutters and neighbors, you know, I'm I was struck by the fact that we have a special permit that was never enforced. I mean, the special permit that was never followed. The parking was never built, so there were parking problems with the abutters and in the neighborhood. Um, the 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 permit the permit that was given to build you know a certain project that wasn't followed either and so we have as built drawings you know you're coming to us asking us a decade or two later like oh i didn't follow what you, you the planning board or the zba said to build but can you accept these plans and so you know so it's a history of non-conformance with the special permit and so you know and so I, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this other request for a special permit with sort of a, 
curious feeling of is anything going to be done or people are going to follow the rules. I also like when I was looking for a house in Amherst, I had the realtor said to me, a lot of people put in a sink in a bedroom with a bathroom and, you know, basically, you know, rent it out. They'll get it put in a, a refrigerator, a microwave, a cooktop, you know, a convection oven. And basically that's an apartment. And so as long as the person has a way in and out, that's kind of, you know, they have that as an apartment. It's, it's an informal apartment. And so when I looked at these, you know, bedroom six and there's a sink there and, you know, you're, you're basically saying this person, my tenants or my roomers there are really very autonomous, um, are always eating somewhere else or in their room, maybe cooking, coming up for cookies occasionally. It looks to me like an informal illegal apartment. And so I, I you know, I don't know why that sink is there. Like, I, why is that sink? There? There's a bathroom sink there's a shower and why is there, why did you put a sink in there? And so I just think this is being used basically as an, a separate apartment. Well, well, Janet, does that mean you, you, you are aiming to consider it a triplex and you, and add another parking space because there's three units and two borders? I think to me, it looks like there, this, there's three functional units here. And I would think to make, to get rid of this idea of having a separate apartment informally, illegally, whatever, is to remove the sink and remove the refrigerator and remove the cooking facilities. It doesn't seem normal to me to have a rooming house with everybody cooking separately and with separate refrigerators and microwaves and ways to do that. So I, I would love to see that sink gone and no cooking facilities and then it would be a rooming house where there's one common kitchen, which is in our in our definitions. I know a lot of people, a lot of students, and actually maybe even staff have live in apartments in Amherst and do a, eat a lot at UMass, you know, <laughs> get a lot of their meals. So I, I just, I just, you know, I'm looking at a history of non-compliance with the special permits, problems with the neighbors, an odd sink. And it looks like a, and it, what it looks like to me in function, a separate apartment. Okay, thanks for that comment. Uh, Bruce. Um, I did receive the, uh, the second packet. I just didn't realize the extent of it, I'm sorry, but I have uh, reviewed it in the course of the uh, conversation over the last half hour. And uh, my architectural background means I can look at these things fairly quickly and, and digest it reasonably thoroughly, I think. So I think I'm up to speed. I just wanted to tell you, Mr. Chair, that I'm, I think I'm, I'm good on that. Um, I have a comment and a question. I, I notice here that, that, this, uh, that we, we, we are discussing the parking and, the, and, and also the discussing the, uh, the, uh, the acceptance of the the as built over the original, and they're kind of two separate uh, topics. Um, so my comment uh, on the parking um, provisions here is uh, 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 I echo the concerns of some of the other, some of my colleagues here, but mine is uh, perhaps a little different. Um, I, what I'm seeing in this site plan here is a very unorthodox uh, use of a site for a, a relatively small house, but let's just say an average size house, um, with so much parking uh, dominating the, uh, the exterior space, the yard. And it's, um, uh, it, it's, 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 it's certainly unorthodox, it's unconventional, it's um, uh, unusual. And, and it seems to me that whereas the current owners may have a, a lifestyle and so forth that validates this. Um, my concern might be for subsequent um, uh, owners because it, it, it doesn't feel like a, a, a normal house. And it seems that the next life of this house, the next owner, if I were a butter here, I would have, uh, a little, it would take little imagination to imagine who would the next owner be. And it would be someone who would basically take advantage of all this parking and possibly uh, 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 use it for uh, the, the kind of uh, uses that are not, uh, don't altogether augment uh, positively a neighborhood. 
So that would be a, a concern that uh, I, I would expect to hear from the, the neighborhood. And it certainly uh, it doesn't take much imagination to see from this unconventional uh, allocation, uh, 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 the large amount of parking here. Um, it doesn't feel good to me. That's, uh, the, uh, no, that's the comment. Uh, the question I have relates to the, uh, uh, the house and the asphalt. The permit the, from, was it 2007 or nine? Uh, is for a, a two family, but uh, when I look at the house, uh, it doesn't see, it doesn't, I don't know how it's divided into a two family. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and if it is, is there a, a fire separation? It, it seems to me as though this is a, a house that's a conventional one family, single family house that admits uh, rumors into it. Uh, so I don't understand how the uh, how the separation into two families exists. So I guess that would be a question that I'd like answered. All right. So why don't we uh, allow it? Uh, I let's see. I'm I'm forgetting forgetting the name of the woman of who was the owner who raised her hand. Go Carol. ahead. Yeah. Okay. So um, first of all, the house. I'm going to answer the sink question. All right, I wanted that bedroom originally to be my bedroom. So I put that sink in because I do art and I wanted a good sink because I wanted it handy right there because I do art and so I didn't want to use the bathroom sink. Okay, that's one thing. But the second thing is the way the house was designed, Bonnie came, they all looked, I have all the proper fire stops and everything. You, you, if, if When you look back through my file, you will see that I meet all criteria. I, I mean, Bonnie, who was the building inspector at the time, I meet all the criteria for a separate unit. So where you're questioning uh -huh. fire stops and stuff, if you were to look right through the, all the information that you have in the building department, you will see that that was all checked. So that doesn't have to be like relitigated. It was completely looked at by the previous building inspector. And, so, and we were granted a, a small uh, efficiency apartment there. Um, so I don't know why that has to be in question now. We we did do all the proper permits. I don't. Uh, you know, we didn't. Well, hold on. Can can I interrupt? I, I'm not uh, questioning the the the, uh, the. I'm simply asking where it is, and I think now I can see. I was confused because there's a, a, a there's a efficiency apartment, and I can see that there's an exterior wall at the top and the doorway at the bottom, and the wall to the bedroom six. But then there's a, a laundry and a stair, and and it 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 seems to it's hard for me to understand where the uh, where the efficiency apartment uh, begins and ends. And I just wanted to make sure that oh. that uh, I understood that. Yeah, if and I being can explain. A... I see it now. You you now see it now that you're looking yeah. at the plan. Yeah. Yep. Do you understand? Yeah. Okay. So that answers so that question. To, so to get back to the other question, and and we an I answered that in uh, in a response. Uh, when Carol first set out to uh, do this renovation back in 2007, she had a plan, a much more elaborate uh, rear unit that she was going to live in and then rent out the front part. Uh, and if you look at the, the drawings that we had done by Fitch uh, of how the house existed prior to 2007, you'll see that it was not modified very much at all to reach what you see here as the as-built drawings. What happened was the absolute cost of doing the, the plan that she had put forth was overwhelming. And so she basically just put it together as you see it here. Uh, and uh, Bonnie was okay with it. Uh, what you're seeing here is what was inspected and what the CFO was issued against. And that was one of Rob's original concerns was is that uh, what was inspected had never really, uh, it wasn't really on the original plan. So that's the reason, I mean, you have to go back to, to the, the history of what this house looked like prior to 2007. And it's very, pretty similar to what it is now. Uh, bedroom six at the time was a uh, uh, workshop. 
outdoor that was a workshop and where the efficiency apartment is was outside that didn't exist so i'm not sure if that answers your question but i just wanted to reiterate a little bit why things ended up being the way they are and why they are what they are now okay yes, so that, thank, that thank helps you. thank you thank you bruce and thank you bruce uh chris i see your hand uh again or still sure yeah well i just i don't want to lose track of <laughs> some of the comments that are going um so i think i just i wanted to raise a couple of things is that you know uh, certainly um appreciate the concern where what was built varied from the approved plan um, and fortunately, I can I can say this part because Rob wasn't uh, the building inspector at that time. Is that that uh, the mechanism the town has to ensure that happens is with the building department. When that building permit gets pulled, um, it's supposed to reflect the the approved plan, or or the permit should be denied. Um, and I think that um, I can appreciate some of the concerns that are being raised, but but many of them I think are issues with the zoning. And I think that what we're talking about with, with a room that has a, a, a sink like that, you know, based on the text of zoning as it is now, uh, it qualifies as, as a room to rent and perhaps it shouldn't, um, but, but I think that's, uh, that's a, a, an issue of the zoning. Um, and the other thing I wanna highlight on the site plan is that well, it feels like this parking area dominates the open space because when you come on this site, you see this lawn and you see that most of it's going to be filled by a parking lot. I do want to highlight that almost half of this property is actually a protected open space because it consists of wetland and buffer. So while uh, stepping on the site, this doesn't really look like part of the property. There actually is quite a lot of green space here that can never be touched. So, um, okay. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Insert that now so I didn't forget later. All right. Karen, you are next. Karen, you're muted. You're, yes, you are muted. Sorry. Uh, I think many of my concerns have been answered by Chris. I, that's really interesting. I, I didn't realize that all that wetland was really part of the property. But um, pursuing this, I wonder, uh, am I able to make a, a motion that um, part of these rooms can be only rented out to people that have no cars? Is that even possible? Well, or I think, that... I think uh, you can certainly make a motion at, you know, and, and it will either be seconded or not um, at any time. Uh, I do but think, is it legal? To, I, I think is it... we ought to let uh, all the comments come from the board and then uh, I want to give the public a chance to comment too, since this has been a particularly controversial property from the point of view of some of the public. So if you can hold on on, 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 on making a motion. I, I, I'm not planning to. I was just asking if that was even something that that one can do or if they are legally required if you're going to have a room to provide these two parking plots that was my question i'm i well, I, I, think, certainly... I think the, the questions we're going to be needing to decide is how many borders are allowed in the owner occupied part of the property and how many parking spaces do we want to allow uh, on the property all right, uh, Mr. Allen, your hand is raised. Oh, I, I had already asked it. For, you, so that's a legacy. Asked, yeah. All right, yeah. thank you. I will drop your hand. Uh, Janet, your hand is up. So I, um, I wanted to talk about parking too. Um, and I did think that putting those two spaces in the front and all the spaces in the back just the ones in the front just seemed kind of randomly, they're not, they don't seem connected with the driveway or kind of where you, you would normally see parking spaces. Um, so I have, my question is like, it looks like, why aren't these back parking spaces closer to the building? Like, could you pull them closer to the building and maybe add a six space? Um, like what's, you know, this piece in between. And then 
could you make the driveway a little wider and have some parallel um, parking on the, I believe it would be the north side of the property, you know, so you could have a few cars parked there, maybe a few in the back and get rid of these two spaces up front. And, you know, just to Chris? help, and maybe yeah. I would also just to help that woman across the street who needs, you know, full space for her um, to get to her ramp, maybe we can just have some, you know, blocks put up there or rocks or something to prevent people from parking there. I just, it just seemed like there is a lot of parking on this property. I'm not convinced that we need seven spaces, but I didn't like those two out front. And I wondered if we could bring in some more spaces in a, in a conventional driveway or move parking closer to the house, if that was, if there's, you know, flexibility in that. Chris Chamberlain. Yeah, so what, what's not picked up on the survey here is there is a walkway um, next to the deck which accesses um, a garage, not really a garage space, but a space with, a, with an overhead garage door, which is where the bike parking is actually, um, <laughs> and is also access to the entrances that you see on the basement level right here. Um, and then additionally, there are existing trees. They're not huge trees. So, I mean, if, if that were something the board would insist on, we could talk uh, with Bruce and Carol, whether they'd be open to changing the vegetation here. But there, there are existing trees in this location. Um, and so that's why this was sort of the limit of where we wanted to impose uh, on the parking. Um, and, you know, as for the uh, spaces along the driveway as a possibility, I think the I won't speak entirely for them, but I think that that the owner doesn't necessarily have an issue with that. But, um, you know, there was expressed concern about the existing sort of informal use of this uh, location here as parking. And so what we looked at was these, uh, you know, pair of head in, head in spaces, which is actually very similar to a situation that, that you see up and down the street. And I think we heard that from from the site visit. Um, but I think from our perspective, we're potentially open to talking about this, although I'd love to get Bruce and Carol's thoughts on, on that. Oh, you know, I also, I think I meant the north side too, like north of, like the north side of the of the driveway. Oh, a, a, Is a there new space? driveway with parallel spots as no, opposed no, no, to no. the two well, I mean, right in. On the, the north side of the existing driveway. Existing driveway, I'm yeah. sorry. Oh, oh, I see. Oh, so uh, then there I would highlight that there's a steep grade right here. You can see there's one, two, three, four, five foot drop on the north side of the driveway. Oh, so you'd have to carve it out. Okay. Right. Let me let me, let me just comment here. The uh, I, I put together a, a, a whole dissertation of how people park on Spalding Street, and hopefully all of you have read it, uh, the association with curb cuts. Uh, there, uh, the this type of parking on the south side of uh, on the uh, east side of Spalding Street is quite common if you would drive up and down the street, uh, mainly because the uh, the uh, public right of way is very narrow on this side of the street. The majority of all people on this side on this side of the street park in the right of way in a very similar fashion to this. So it is not unusual on this street to see a front parking area like this. Uh, in fact, it makes it better for our, our handicapped person across the street, mainly because the end of her ramp uh, is really right across from that parking area. And yeah. that helps now because no one can now park in the street in front of her, in front of her ramp. So it actually helps her to actually have those two spaces there. And again, uh, you know, if you get a chance, go ahead and read the uh, the information I sent about what parking looks like on the street, and you'll see that this is quite common on the street and does not stand out. Okay. Oh, my wife wanted to say something. Okay. I have, I have one more question about parking. How many cars are you? Do your rumors and you usually park or have? Or do you usually have seven cars or five cars or four? Well, like just, here's the situation. The situation is. You can never control whether a tenant has a car. It's impossible because we've had, I mean, right now we have two tenants that don't have cars, but we've had tenants that move in, they don't have a car. And then they go out and buy a car and, and all of a sudden they're parking in your driveway. So what do you do? You, 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 what do you, how do you do? Kick them out? You can't do that. You can't control people and their cars. You can put it, I mean, unless we want to, uh, I don't know, how do you kick people out? I don't know how to no, do that, but, no, I... but, but what I'm saying is, Historically, we've had as, as few as two cars. Uh, we've had as many as, as seven cars. It varies. 
Okay, can yes. let yes, me Carol. See. Okay, number one, I'll talk about those two spaces. First of all, I'm 70 years old. I've got a lot of artificial parts and I've got them in my back. I've got them in my feet and I, I've had a lot of injuries. That double parking space will, uh, there is already an existing walkway that will go to a little deck that's on the side of my house that I can get into the house with only three stairs. <clears throat> I see it as an aging in place. I plan on being in this house to age in place. And I need to be close by, see the little deck that you can see there? It only has a couple of stairs. If I park there, my car is very close to where I can get up those couple of stairs and right into the house and go straight into the kitchen or the bedrooms. So that is really important to me, those two little spaces. now. Over to answer some of the other questions, since I've been here a lot longer than my husband, 37 years. So I will say that I have taken people without cars before. I've said, nope, can't have a car. I'm looking for somebody without a car. And I think that is definitely possible, but it, it is difficult. I'm not saying it isn't impossible. Um, the fact of the matter is there are two of us and there, we do have the auxiliary apartment, and I think by uh, what we're supposed to have for that is two spaces, I believe, for the apartment. So that puts us at four. Um, we could stipulate that the the our duplex apartment would only have one parking space, um, and that could be a possibility. That makes three, but I really think. Usually, we have four cars here. Sometimes we have, we've had six cars here. But I will tell you, the real problem is that my neighbor across the street, not my other neighbors, but the neighbor directly across the street, um, that would be Rebecca uh, de Corsi Cornell, who is the property manager. She believes that it is no one could be parking on the street. That's what she believes. She, she doesn't agree that we can be parking on the street at all. And she also doesn't believe that any tire should be on grass no matter what. And so she constantly has called me out nonstop for that, specifically parking any, anywhere where there's one inch of your, of your, um, your tire on grass, she doesn't like it. Now, Ms. Al Ms. Albano, I, I just wanna let you know that uh, Ms. Cornell is, is in the public attendees. That's fine. And then that she will get a chance to comment this evening and okay. I don't want this to become too contentious. All right, there's one more thing. We just found out the property line was farther over than we knew before. So I, I don't know whether the planning board would let us put four cars it, next to the house in that property line, but we could possibly pave and have four cars there and two cars in the front, which would give us six. I think we could do it with six. We could live our lives and not park on the street and it would work for us, but it would require us to redo the plans, but we could do that. Mm. And Okay. If, if that would still qualify, uh, putting again, we'd have to move the the paved parking lot over and make it wider, and there would have to be four cars there and the two in front, and then we wouldn't end up you having to add in the back. So okay. that's another idea. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so we've heard from Janet and we've heard from Bruce. Um, before I go to public comment, Andrew or Tom or Johanna, uh, do you want to comment at all at this point, or do you want to wait until after public comment? Johanna. Oh, gosh, I don't know. I mean, the whole situation just seems like a big pickle. It seems like there was a special permit and then the work wasn't done and you know it's non-compliant with the parking requirements 
I too feel like, gosh, it's a shame to put a big impermeable parking lot close to wetlands and, you know, eliminate open space, but it seems like the, the status quo is untenable. You can't have, you know, cars on a butter's properties and you can't have cars obstructing the road in ways that, you know, create problems. So, um, I don't know. I mean, it seems to me this solves some of like this solves, solves some of that, right? So, by the way, the parking might be considered permeable because it's gravel. Yeah, I yep, might might. I don't know. You know, the engineer is not, not going to attest to that. Yeah, <laughs> it's not a you know, it's not a truly permeable right surface. So okay, those are my thoughts. All right. I just wanted Thanks. to say that in the 2007 wetlands permit, it was required to be a permeable gravel parking area. So that's in the original permit. That it had to be gravel. Right. And they wanted us to have four in the back. Yep. OK. All right. So at this time, why don't we go to public comment? Oh, Nate, uh, go ahead. Sure, so, <clears throat> hi, Doug. Uh, uh, for everyone who's been listening, I'm Nate Malloy, a planner with the town. Um, there is the development application report. I don't know if you want to go over that after the comments or yep. at some point. Yeah. Uh, when when would it be a good time to do that? Okay. Uh, would it be now or after public comment? Well, given uh, that you're struggling to stay with us, you want to go ahead now? I'm not struggling too much, but um, well, the coffee doesn't last forever. It doesn't. Uh, so you know, uh, there was a development application report provided by staff. Uh, Bruce responded to it. You know, I think, you know, there are waivers requested as part of the application, you know, a sign plan, uh, you know, they're not proposing any, um, a waiver for traffic impact statement, a lighting plan, a soil erosion plan, you know, that's uh, taken care of with their conservation commission approval. Um, they're asking for a waiver from construction logistics plan and pollution and hazardous material plan. Um, so there are waivers with this. Um, in the report, you know, there's for issues to consider, um, you know, there wasn't much with the building and architecture, although it wasn't built according to plans, you know, it is, it is what it is. So it's existing conditions. Um, with the landscape and site improvements, you know, there was a discussion about the parking spaces, um, what's in the front of the house, and if, you know, uh, if there could be screening along the, the driveway, um, you know, between the driveway and the, and the property boundary to the south. And so, um, you know, whether that's in the form of vegetation or a fence, you know, is there a way to prevent people from parking off the driveway as is happening now? So, you know, Chris Chamberlain mentioned that cars park off the driveway and is there a way to kind of ensure that that wouldn't happen, you know, on the apron or just off the driveway? Um, there wasn't really many issues with the utilities or stormwater um, in part because um, um, it doesn't really, you know, the project is not that big. Um, in terms of lighting, they provided, um, you know, images of the dark sky compliant shields. So I think that was something, you know, asked for locations on plan. So they responded to that um, site management um, plan. They, you know, they provided that. Um, the order of conditions does include a provision that snow cannot be stored within the 25 foot buffer zone. And it has been mentioned. Um, it could be important to reiterate as a condition. Um, and then, you know, parking and circulation, uh, you know, we noted just that there's these two curb cuts and, you know, is it appropriate to have the two spaces out front in the front setback? Um, and that, that's really it. You know, the town engineer said that typically two curb cuts would not be allowed on a property unless it's through a, a, a special permit or a site plan review. So typically, you know, if someone is developing a property, we'd want to limit it to one, one you know, driveway apron. Um, unless it is by a land use permit. So he didn't have any, you know, there was no objection, just an acknowledgement that this would be the process to allow that. Nate, I did notice that you, you pointed out that the fire department and the town engineer have not submitted comments. Is, so that, that, was after, yeah. is that a reason for us to have to continue this or delay deciding anything tonight? So I think the town engineer had responded uh, after the fact, and I think just had that one comment about, you know, the a land use permit would allow the two driveway uh, curb cuts. And I'm not aware if fire has responded. Um, 
Okay. I've, I've been out for a few days. All right. Uh, Chris, Chris Prestrup, are you waiting for comments from FIRE? I do not know if uh, comments have been received. Maybe Pam knows because Pam usually sends out the transmittals. Um, we have not received comments from FIRE. I've actually set, sent them a second um, um, a second request asking for those, but we haven't received them yet. Okay. So Chris Brestrup, is that a, you know, is that a critical part of this process and that we, we're probably going to not even be able to close this tonight if we wanted to? Well, it's a normal part of the process. And it seems like there have been a number of questions that have arisen that the um, applicant may want to talk to their engineer about you know, some other possible solutions to things. Um, and so it may be reasonable to continue this public hearing to a date certain to wrap it up. Okay. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go ahead to public comment. Uh, I know we've got a couple of members of the public that probably wanna speak. Um, so at this time, uh, attendees of the public, would you please raise your hand uh, if you are uh, interested in making a comment. This is your chance to make your statement. Okay, I do not see any hands raised for public comment. One uh, has just popped up. Oh, okay, yep, there we go. Uh, would you please bring uh, Rebecca Cornell over into the uh, panelists? And Ms. Cornell, if you would uh, give us your name and your, your address of residence, and um, you will have three minutes for your comment. Hi, my name is Rebecca DeCourcy Cornell. Um, I live in West Brookfield. I'm here um, for my family who owns a property at 60 Spalding Street. Um, thank you all for getting through a very challenging permit. I think you all hit all of the issues on the head, you have um, discussed everything that I have discussed since 2009. This is 13 years. I have been trying to get my neighbor to put in parking to accommodate her tenants because they park on the street and she does not control them. She admitted that tonight, she can't control the tenants. Um, it might seem like a lot of gravel, but if you go up and down Spalding Street on a small dead end street, that's what we have to do in our neighborhood to accommodate. Um, I heard her say tonight that she would be happy with six cars, four out back and two in the front. I would be very happy with six cars, four out back and two in the front, because the code enforcement team has documented that there are five cars that are repeatedly parked there, and several of them have been parked illegally. Um, other than that, I mean, we rent out rooms in our house across the street, and it is a great situation to just have international people come in, become part of your family, and that's how we pay our taxes, quite honestly. Um, other than the parking, I have no problem with this at all. It is just the parking, which is what I'm really asking you to find a re resolution to tonight. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Ms. Cornell, and thank you for your your statements of support about the about six parking spaces and um, that you do appreciate the benefits of renting to students. Um, so that, at least from the public point of view, oh, okay, we have a second hand from uh, Amy Gates, if we could bring her over. Please give us your name and your street address. Yes, my name is Amy Gates. I'm at 54 Spalding Street, which is sort of across the street from Carol and Bruce. Um, and my issue, I have a few things that concern me deeply. This, the idea of seven parking spaces, is, there's no one, not one house on Spalding Street has seven parking spaces. The only one that does is the one that's right off of Main Street, and that's all students. And my feeling is, you know, they're not going to have this house forever. I think Bruce um, Coldman, do I have that right? You brought that up, uh, that, you know, thinking big picture in the future, this is not conducive to keeping the street a calm, quiet little residential street if it's suddenly going to have seven parking spaces. Um, and 
I also have a trouble, I have trouble with the idea of gravel because no matter what you do, gravel leaches and leaks and gets everywhere. And I'm concerned that it's going to slowly make its way down towards the wetlands. And um, in terms of snow blowing, I've had my window broken because, you know, someone's snow blowing and the gravel hit my window. It's just snow blowing and snow plowing is not really uh, ideal on gravel. And again, someone mentioned that, yes, while Mr. Allen may be an expert at it, the next person won't be. But really, I'm just thinking about this, the spillage of it eventually. It just, it just works its way with rain. It just does. I, I know because I live, I live with it. Um, and the other thing I'm concerned about is proper plantings. I don't know if on the south side, there's, there's a house that, there, you know, the headlights are going to be looking right into the house that abuts this, this um, green space. And so I'm wondering if there are going to be any kind of plantings on that southern side to help the neighbor there. Um, and what the proper p positioning is, because, you know, whatever's put in is going to take years, years to grow to be any kind of realistic screening. Um, I just, I don't think we can minimize the impact of having seven spaces for one house. It's just, to me, it's... So it sounds like you also would be supportive of fewer parking spaces. Yes, very much. Very much, yes. Okay, but we need to make sure there's enough so that people are not parking on the street. Yes, yes, that I understand. That I understand. <clears throat> and okay. the lighting, I just want to make sure if there's floodlights that they're truly going to be not pointing in our houses at night. That's another issue that concerns me. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. Um, Let's see. So we have another hand from the public, uh, Mr. Rob Crowner. If you would bring Rob over into the panelists. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I think Rob was a longtime member of this planning board before he, he retired to other pursuits. Please give us your name and your street address, Rob. <laughs> well, thanks for the introduction. I'm Rob Crowner, uh, 44 Spalding Street. Um, so I'm wondering whether um, your acceptance of you've, it's been talked about accepting the existing plans, whether that enshrines this use as a duplex, when it's clear from almost everyone who's mentioned it, that that second unit is actually a, a, an accessory dwelling. Um, and so I'm wondering whether um, there's an opportunity to fix the the use category for this uh, um, property to be a, a single family home with, a, with an accessory dwelling, which is allowed. Okay, um, that is a question which I would want to have Rob Mora weigh in on before we got very far into it. We have heard from Rob that he considers that bedroom number six not to be a dwelling unit because it didn't have adequate or sufficient uh, kitchen cooking equipment. Rob? So I, I didn't really see that as a possibility uh, as a solution. So there's the two dwelling units, um, the main house, the efficiency unit, and then bedroom six, which has been in question. Um, the bylaw only allows an accessory dwelling unit, accessory to a single family dwelling. So we can't have a third unit that's an accessory dwelling unit. And if we only had um, two units and one of them being an accessory dwelling unit, we also cannot also have uh, lodgers and boarders as accessory uses under article three. So that did just didn't seem like it fit what the owners were trying to do. Uh, so we, we didn't really consider that as an option because it would significantly uh, change the use uh, from what they're envisioning and, uh, you know, create a lot of space in the house that probably wouldn't be usable uh, in that, that type of uh, permanent path. Okay, thank you. So if we continue to consider this a duplex, um, you know, we are being asked to accept the plans as they've been built. Um, and at least according to Rob, it's considered a duplex with, you know, the, the efficiency apartment and then the rest of the house, which has up to six bedrooms. 
Um, if we accept that, then we can have a conversation about how many parking spaces are appropriate for that kind of building. Um, given what you've heard this evening, uh, Mr. Allen and Ms. Albano, uh, would you like to go back and think about adjusting the plan to maybe go from seven to six? And uh, I know there's been concern about the gravel and it migrating and you know maybe it would be worth thinking about something that's a little bit more durable um so i i pose that question to you it sounds like we're probably going to need to continue this hearing to another date anyway so um we'll go as far as we we need to this evening uh but it is 9 35 and uh we've been at it for three hours so would you guys want to make a comment? I see you are muted. Uh, I, first thing I wanted to point out, if you, if you look at the uh, information I sent you about Spalding Street, there was a whole section on curb cuts. Uh, we have one house on Spalding, which actually has over three curb cuts. We have a number of uh, places which have at least two curb cuts. Uh, we have a curb cut at the end of the street, which is 60 feet wide. So adding an additional curb cut on the front of this house is not going to be any different than any of the other houses along this street. Uh, and so I just wanted to point that out. Secondly, uh, I know in a lot of towns, they are encouraging gravel parking because, uh, because it, is, it is pervious as opposed to asphalt, which is not. And uh, we had always thought that it was more environmentally friendly to use gravel than asphalt because of all the runoff associated with it and how, it, how its impact on the wetlands uh, would be uh, because uh, it would all drain into the wetlands. Uh, the wetlands administrator here had said she approved the gravel mainly because she knows most of the water coming down the uh, driveway is going to just settle in that gravel and just going to seep right in just like it is now and it'll have no effect on the wetland. And so that was the main concern with, with, with using gravel. It's, it's considered more environmentally friendly uh, okay. than, than asphalt. Okay, thank you. I, uh, Chris Brestrup, I will tell you, I don't remember seeing a synopsis from Bruce Allen describing the curb cuts along Spalding Street. I yeah, think they came, they came in an email. Oh, um, so that, that was we... one of the six files we got later yes you got several files after you received your original packet and you may not have all had a chance to read those files they are all posted online now pam has been posting them as each document comes in but you may not have had a chance to read all of them so that may be another reason to continue this okay yeah i did open a couple of those but i did not open all six yeah they right. addressed a couple of things there including um some cut sheets on the lighting and um, revised plans that show the surveyed property line and things of that nature. Okay. Chris, uh, Chris Chamberlain, I wanted to ask you, uh, since the topic of, of migration of gravel has come up, uh, would there be an option to put a, some sort of curb at the east end of this parking lot so that, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's not, at least gravel isn't going to wash down. Um, um, you know, I also wondered about whether there should be some sort of fence at the east end so that no no plow would ever push snow beyond that. Um, I don't know if either of those are really feasible or worth the effort, but uh, they came to mind. Yeah, I, I mean, I certainly wouldn't recommend a fence in that location um, just to cut things off. Uh, sort of a fence in the middle of the properties and, and odd solution anyway. Um, we are we do have the buffer plantings that were required by conservation. Um, and you know, and I would also just highlight that to the extent any of that concern is related to the wetlands is that, you know, we, we did go through the notice of intent process and and those issues were scrutinized as part of it. Um, and as Bruce mentioned, you know, back all the way back in 2007, conservation was actually looking for gravel as opposed to um, an asphalt surface. Okay. Um, All right, curb, thank you. Uh, you know, other, other than adding cost, um, yeah. uh, which for, for a limited benefit wouldn't be the end of the world, but um, I'm not sure how much benefit that would create. Okay. All right. So um, 
The time is 9.40, and I know we have a couple more things on the agenda this evening. Um, so I see uh, the owner's uh, hand, I see Janet's hand, I see Karen's hand. Why don't we run through those comments and then talk about potentially continuing this hearing? So uh, Mr. Allen and Ms. Alb Albano. Okay, so our intention is to, is to age in place here. And really, we do need that those front two parking spaces in order for easy access. We, I'm telling you that that's essential. But um, for us, I mean, Amherst is an expensive place to live when you're retired. We need the renters to be there. Uh, we can't afford that house without the renters. We have had absolutely zero problem. Our problem has only been the parking. So, I mean, all of a sudden we're do, doing, talking all this other stuff. We haven't had any problem or complaint by a tenant or anyone regarding that. It's just been the, the how, where, how to put the cars best and so forth. So I'm very frustrated. I've got oh. taxes that are 13,000 and a half dollars. It's a lot of money for a retiree. Okay. Um, and I'm really distressed at the, the thought that you're going to try to make it so I can't afford to live here. All right. So I, 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 uh, I, I'm sorry if I gave you that impression. Um, you know, we've had a number of comments this evening and there have been a lot of ideas thrown out. So by continuing this hearing, you can think about whether you want to make any changes or whether when we resume the hearing, you want to keep the current plan as the plan we are to be uh, considering. So my, I, I apologize if I was uh, suggesting more too strongly that you consider changes. Well, we've what, complied what, with everything what, you've asked. You okay. asked for you, you asked for us to and and when we draw do this plan up, we didn't actually have an ag accurate boundary line. Now we do actually. <laughs> You know, there are different things, but the bottom line is we have complied, and Rob Mora will tell you, we have complied with all the things that we were asked as we we're going through this process, trying to work this out. I mean, I hope you're going to work the, with us. The other thing I would like to do, I would like to encourage the uh, committee members to actually drive up and down Spalding Street to get an idea of what it really looks like. That's why I did the presentation I did. It's it's, it's a little more unusual. It's not like South Whitney and it's not like Shumway Drive. It's not like those. But I encourage you to come up and do a site visit and see what this street really looks like. And you'll see that what we've proposed is, is within keeping with what everyone else does on this street. And we don't stand out uh, with what we're proposing. And, and I just want you to look at that in context because we don't want to spoil this neighborhood. We like living here. We have a lot of great neighbors. Uh, it's a dead end street, so it's quiet, it's safe. Uh, we don't have any crime or anything like that, and we like it, and we don't want to stand out, and we won't stand out, but you have to see it in context with what the, the way the rest of the street looks before you make a, a decision about that. I just wanted to point that out. And those Ever, Eversource trucks had to go up and down because they were building and taking all those big timbers out. They never had a problem with going around any of the cars, not one time. And there's been a lot of those big trucks. So it's not like, it, oh, it's a the, generic. The other thing I'll point out is we do have a lot of self-employed people on the street who have their, uh, you know, that have their clients park on the street. So on-street parking here is fairly common. The only reason we're not supposed to park on the street is by the rental, the rental bylaws, if we're a landlord, we have to provide parking for our tenants on our property. We cannot have them park on the street. Right. And I, I may, maybe you're aware of that, maybe you're not aware of that, but that's what got us in this difficulty in the first place. So okay, thank you. All right. So uh, let's move on. Janet, quick one, one more quick comment. This is very quick. I wanted to speak in praise of gravel. Um, I have a gravel driveway and we we use a snow blower on it. And when we had a snow plow, it was just pushing, they were pushing the gravel all over the place. So the gravel actually, there is some runoff from it, but most of it just goes into the soil. I have more runoff on, you know, off my lawn than I do the gravel. And then I have a bunch of um, um, shrubs planted at the end and they kind of stop the, you know, the spillover and stuff like that. So I do think it's a very um, environmentally friendly thing and you can snow blow it. I wouldn't suggest a snow plow. Okay, thank you. So my, my plow, my gravel. 
Karen, you're on. I wanted to say once more how really charmed I was by visiting you and your house and uh, what a welcoming place it is for students. Uh, so I, I really feel that we're trying to work with you to have the best solution for everybody. And um, I also hate asphalt driveways and have a gravel, have always had gravel. And I told you about the, the um, oil and stone, which is, I think, really beautiful. And we have a kind of a stone barrier. But there's also other alternatives that I, maybe they're very expensive, you know, those kind of pavers that are uh, sort of, they, they have holes in the middle and it even looks like there's grass. Uh, it could be very beautiful. I don't know if you've looked into anything like that, but especially for the two in front of the house, I think they could be uh, very unproblematic and very beautiful. But anyway, so uh, I'm sure we'll find a good solution for you. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, Mr. Allen. I think is, that's a legacy. <laughs> that's a legacy. All right, we'll drop that hand. Okay, so uh, thank you all for your comments. Thank you, thank you, uh, consultants and owners, for your presence this evening. Um, thank you to the uh, public that attended. I did see a hand for a while from Amy Gates, and it looks like we've lost her. So maybe she'll come back to the next hearing. Um, Chris, do you have a suggestion for a date for our next hearing? I think October 19th would be a good date for this one because September 21st is really full. Okay. Uh, do we have a date or a time that you would suggest? Um, I don't think we have any cases on that night yet. If Pam would um, confirm that for me. So the only other thing we talked about earlier was if the flood maps don't happen on the 21st, they would happen uh, on this night as yeah. well. So mm -hmm. we could put this one first. We could say this is at um, 6.35, October 19th. Mm -hmm. OK. All right. Um, I guess, uh, does anybody want to make a motion to continue this hearing to October 19th at 6.35 PM? I so move. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Janet. And uh, Andrew, you got your hand up before Tom. Second. OK. Uh, Mr. Allen, your hand is ag again up. Are, is that a legacy? Yes. No. Oh. <laughs> uh, you are muted. You, you'll need to unmute. My general impression here is that you're concerned about the number of parking spaces. I'm just trying to get a feel for what the board thinks at this point. Well, we've heard from a, a couple of members. There's a couple of us that haven't really commented. Um, I was sorry to miss the site plan or the site uh, visit last yesterday. Uh, I will make a point of driving down your street and looking at those, at the parking uh, habits, I guess I'll say. Um, and because I have questioned in my own head the, the two spaces that are on the street. But if that is a typical condition, then maybe it's more uh, acceptable. Um, we, we definitely want to solve the parking problem. So um, reducing the number of spaces seems a little bit risky to me, actually. Um, but uh, so, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how much time you want to spend with your engineer, but um, you certainly could look at a six space layout. And um, it sounds like your neighbors at least would be acceptable, okay with that. And then um, you know we can see what that looks like, or you could just come back with what you've already shown, and we can kind of take it or leave it. Um, I yeah, don't know. We'll we'll discuss after after the meeting in in the coming yeah, days. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you, I'm sure you will. Um, we haven't heard from Andrew and Tom, and I don't know. I I hope they will comment if they want to. Uh, Chris, I see your hand up. Chris Prestrup. I just wanted to note that one of the dwelling units is very small, one of the duplex dwelling units. And I think you could make an argument that that dwelling unit only needs one parking space. And so then you would be down to six parking spaces, two for the main unit, one for the um, additional unit, and then one for each of the 
rumors if you chose to allow all three rumors. Right. Yep. And I, I will mention to Chris Chamberlain, um, there was something in the one of the parking bylaws that the parking a, a parking space of five spaces or more had to be designed so that you could turn around and exit. And the easternmost space didn't look like it had a hammerhead that would let you back out and turn around and then head west. So if we lose a space, maybe we lose the eastern space, leaving you with the, the space for the hammerhead. Um, I, I think that's fair. It, I think it works as is, but it's tight. Yeah. OK. Um, Andrew. Yeah, uh, just a quick comment. So I, did, I shared some opinions. I'm, I'm, uh, for the record, I'm fine with six parking spaces, if, if that's the direction folks want to go. Um, so okay right. thank you uh i i take back uh my comment that you hadn't said anything all right um so the time is 9 51 we let's see um does anybody else want to make the motion to continue to october 19th at 6 35 p.m you've already made the motion and oh second. good oh good yeah, i'm all, okay. need a vote. you know it's late um yeah. All right, let's go ahead and, and vote on that. Um, starting again with Bruce. Yes. And Tom. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Janet. Aye. Johanna. Aye. Karen. Aye. And I'm an I as well. So that's unanimous. The time is 9.51, and thank you all for this, uh, your participation in this hearing. Great, thank you. Okay, the next item on our agenda for this evening is the Planning Board Elections and Reorganization. Um, Chris, do you want to say anything? Uh, I believe we need to vote for our chair, our vice chair, our clerk, and then we need to uh, appoint the representatives to the different uh, liaison positions that we are that we participate in. Yes, what you that, need is a planning cover board. Cover everything. Yep, you need okay. a Pioneer Valley Planning Commission Planning Board rep. You need someone for the Community Preservation Act Committee, and you need someone for Design Review Board. You already have Janet McGowan on the Solar Bylaw Working Group, and for Community Resources, um, you have me, because there's not usually a planning board representative, representative on that group. So that's, right. that's what you need. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So uh, why don't we start with the elected positions? And that would start, I guess, with the chair. Um, does anybody want to make any nominations for the chair or volunteer to do that? Andrew. I'd like to nominate Doug Marshall for our chair. Okay, thank you. Johanna. I second that motion. Okay, thank you both. Are there other uh, suggestions or nominations for the ch chair? Don't all speak at once. Uh, <laughs> So I am willing to continue as chair if, if so elected. Um, Chris, should we, would, should we go ahead and vote on each one at a time and then yes, move on to the next? Okay. All right. So um, let's see. Andrew made the motion. Johanna seconded. Uh, I guess we'll vote on whether Doug Marshall should be the chair for another year, uh, starting with Bruce. Yes. And Tom. Aye. And Andrew. Aye. And Janet. Aye. Johanna. Aye. Karen. Aye. And I probably feel like I should abstain. So it carries <laughs> six in favor and one abstention. All right. The next uh, position is uh, vice chair. And I will, I personally will nominate Tom Long. He has served with distinction um, uh, in this past year. So that is my motion or my nomination, I will say. And if anybody wants to second that or any, anybody has any other uh, nominations. Andrew. 
I would second that. Okay. Uh, Janet, I saw some fingers from you. Was that? That, a... was, my, that was my second, but okay. it, was, it wasn't clear. <laughs> okay. Do we have any other nominations for the vice chair? And Tom, are you willing to serve as vice chair? Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. All right. So uh, we have one nomination and a second. And so why don't we go ahead with that vote? Uh, Bruce. Oh, yes. And uh, Tom. Abstain. And Andrew. Aye. And Janet. Aye. And Johanna. Aye. And Karen. Aye. And I am an aye as well. Six in favor, one abstention. All right. Uh, our previous clerk has come off the board, so we, we need a new clerk. And um, in the sort of two and a half years I've been on the board, I think the primary job of the clerk is to actually run the meeting if both the chair and the vice chair are absent. Uh, our clerk hasn't really done any special minute taking, uh, although all of us pitched in at one point last year when we were behind on minutes. So Tom, I see your hand first, a nomination for clerk. I would say the uh, long, longest standing member, Janet, should um, be our clerk. Janet McGowan, nominated as clerk. Andrew? I was going to nominate Janet as well, so I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> I will second that. All right. <laughs> All right, do we have other nominations for clerk? Oh, please. <laughs> you want to nominate someone, Janet? I, I, I would love not to be clerk. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think it's going to be a particularly onerous position. It's a lot of no, responsibility. What about Johanna? Do you have a position? I, I don't. Johanna, I would be. I nominate no, Johanna as a clerk. <laughs> in a friendly way <laughs> but you don't have to accept well let's see i would i would second johanna if 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 she would accept such a position i think i would i mean i've watched maria can i just wax poetic for a second yeah, and share sure. my thoughts so um there were a couple of moments over the course of the last couple of years where maria took live minutes during the meeting I think oh. that is in her role as clerk, um, you know, filling in for Pam. I'd be happy to assume that role. Oh, and <laughs> with the, you know, I don't know if, yeah, if the chair and the vice chair are unavailable, I'd be happy to chair the meeting. Mm -hmm. So, but we do have a motion on the table that was yeah. seconded to Janet. Yeah. So we need to, we'd need to take we that have, one. We now have two nominations, both which were seconded. Um, and Janet, does it is it is it am I am I interpreting correctly that you would prefer not to be clerk? Yes, you're interpreting that. <laughs> also, I'm I'm kind of busy on the other um, the I'm solar sorry. bylaw working solar group, which I just took minutes for. So, okay. um, Tom, did you want to say something? Can I withdraw that nomination? <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. I I guess so. <laughs> And so, Johanna, if you are if you are willing, we will go ahead and vote you. It sounds like okay. Yeah, I'm willing. I mean, I, it doesn't seem like a huge time commitment outside of meetings, and be. that's I mean, my. You know, we did have we did we did, did have that point last year where we got way behind on minutes, mm -hmm. and um, and I did ask Maria to take a, take a couple to 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 help uh, you know Chris and Pam get caught up on the other ones. So uh, that could happen, but we seem to be keeping up better now. So um, I think it's less likely. Okay, so uh, Tom, your Ms. hand again, is that true? No, okay. Mr. Marshall, I'm not sure who seconded Johanna. Uh, I did actually. You did, okay. Yes, for the record. For the record. Okay, so uh, why don't we vote on Johanna for clerk and we'll just run through it again. Uh, Bruce. Yes. 
and Tom. Aye. And Andrew. Aye. And Janet. That was a yes, I believe. Aye, aye, sorry. Uh, Johanna. Aye. And Karen. <laughs> aye. All right, now I'm an I as well. So that's all seven in favor. So yes. congratulations to all the new officers. <laughs> okay, so moving on to our liaison positions. Uh, let's start with the PVPC. And I know that Bruce has expressed a willingness at least uh, to take that position. Are there other nominations that people would like to make? Actually, why don't I nominate Bruce for that position if we're gonna keep up with the seconds and all that stuff. So somebody ought to second Bruce. Um, Tom? I second Bruce. Okay. Are there any other nominations for the liaison to PVPC? I don't see any. Uh, Bruce, are you okay with that still? Yes. Uh, yes, I was. And I'm especially okay uh, having read uh, Jack's uh, uh, report and the and the various correspondence. I will probably I don't know Jack from a bar of soap, but I think I'm going to get to know him uh, very shortly after tonight. <laughs> He's much much more interesting than a bar of soap, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. So, uh, Chris, do we need to vote on that? I would vote. Yep. Okay. All right. So, can we do it just by a sh show of hands? Sure. Why not? All right, uh, all hands. Well, uh, mm, well two yeah. hands. no, you know what? You can't do it, that in a, it in a, a roll. Meeting. You got to take it a roll call. All right, all right. So uh, this is to not to nominate or appoint Bruce as our liaison to PVPC. Bruce, how do you vote? Well, following Joanna's uh, precedent, yes. All right, uh, Tom. Aye. And Andrew. Aye. And Janet. Aye. Johanna. Aye. And Karen. Aye. And I'm an I as well, seven. All right. All right, that was Bruce for PVPC. Now CPAC. Um, Andrew, you've, uh, I, I'm gonna nominate Andrew. Andrew has done this the last year, maybe two. Um, when you took the position originally, you had a little concern about your travel schedule. And how has that worked? And are you willing to continue doing it? Um, travels work fine. I am willing to do it. I will say that it, it is a, it's actually a pretty exciting committee to be on because you help um, distribute funds to, to really worthy projects. So um, again, happy to do it, um, but it, it's, it also can be very rewarding if somebody else wants to uh, be considered. Okay. All right. Um, so are there others that would would like to do it? I mean, Tom, I see your hand. I'm, I'm just seconding seconding your nomination of Andrew. Of Andrew. OK. All right. Uh, so OK, so is, does anybody else you know, want to particularly want to do that? I mean, it's sounds like Andrew's having a good time with it. All right. So we'll let that go and uh, another vote here for Andrew as liaison to CPAC. Um, uh, we'll start at the other end this time. Karen. Aye. And Johanna. Aye. And Janet. Aye. And Andrew. Abstain. And Tom. Aye. And Bruce. Yep. All right, so that's, and I'm an I as well. That's six in favor and one abstention. All right, then the last uh, appointment is to the DRB, the Design Review Board. Um, I guess I'll hold off at this point. Does anybody want to volunteer or nominate someone else? Uh, Tom Long has been our uh, representative to that board. Uh, Andrew. I would nominate Tom again. Okay. I will second. All right. Uh, does anybody else want to make some nominations or volunteer? 
Okay, I guess we should always do this at 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> Nobody, we usually do. <laughs> nobody's coming up with any new ideas. All right, so uh, go. we will vote on Tom for the DRB liaison, uh, starting with Karen. Aye. And, and Johanna. Aye. All right, Janet. Aye. Uh, Andrew. Aye. Tom? Aye. And Bruce? Yep. And I'm an aye as well. OK. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, that's, that's everything, I believe, Chris. That's right. Yep. Um, All right. So that was the end of uh, topic number six on our agenda. The time is 10.05. Doug, I have to leave. I'm sorry to say, but I. I'm camping and I need to get back before like I'm locked out. <laughs> All right. Well, happy trails. Thank you. Bye bye. So Janet left us at 1006. All right. The next topic is old business. Anything you want to bring up, Chris? I can't think of anything. Nope. All right. Uh, the next is new business. Anything on that? Category. Can't think of anything. Can Pam think of anything? No. Uh, well, the only thing I would say is that we're working on a new way to post the packets. So stay tuned. Okay, great. Um, so the next item, number nine on our agenda, is Form A and R's. It sounds like there is one of those. There is one. Is Nate still with us? He is. He is. He's. Hi, Nate. I have some pictures, Nate. I think the pictures explain it all. No. Um, so it's the street, 1720. Yeah, so it's a property on, you know, far down on Southeast Street. And, uh, um, you know, they're proposing to carve, well, you know, they're showing that they have the ability to carve off this little house lot shown in blue here. And, you know, there are some questions about whether or not uh, there are the right dimensions from the existing structures in terms of setbacks and everything. So they confirm that with survey. So there is, you know, this is, um, you know, it could actually be, um, you know, it's a separate lot there, although it is a, a funny shape and meets the dimensional requirements and everything. And, and the circle that we usually have fits in the? Yep. Yeah, you can see that yeah. in the bigger plan, but it does. Okay. okay. All right. All right. Um, so they're, they're separating this out into a separate lot. Um, and uh, it sounds like Nate and Chris, you don't think there's any subdivision app uh, approval required? No. All right. So does the board um, authorize Doug to sign the plan? Uh, or I'll put it a different way. Does anyone object to my uh, signing the plan on behalf of the board? So if you object, please raise your hand. OK, Chris, I'm not seeing any hands raised. So we'll have to make a, um, an appointment. Mm -hmm. Right, another clandestine meeting behind <laughs> town hall. Okay, so that is uh, item nine on the agenda. The time is 10.09. Uh, upcoming ZBA applications. Uh, looks like we have one or two here. We have two. The first one, um, and it, it's getting late, so I'll do my best to articulate this. So this first one, um, is at 615 Main Street, and it is to, for two concrete pads right here. Um, and it's to, in order to um, construct fiber telecommunication cabinets. So let's see, which picture was I on? Here it is, the picture is just a little bit better here. Um, this one, when I talked to Maureen Pollock about it, she was like, it was, it's, you know, it's pretty, 
pretty much just an ordinary, um, you know, application. And the second one that's going to come up again on September 22nd. So this one is, is a little bit bigger. This is a proposal happening over um, at Applewood. And they are proposing to construct three new buildings. So this is going to be a little pool pavilion right here. This is going to be an addition onto this end of the building. This will be all residential. It will be three floors with two units on each floor. So six units there. And then this spot here um, is going to contain a new meeting room. And there's going to be a winter garden. And there's also going to be two additional units housed here, which I believe it's on the second floor here. So right. that's a that's a much bigger application. All right. So board members, are these of particular interest that you want us to bring them to a future meeting? I will say that personally, I'm I'm not sure we really need to see either one. Uh, if you particularly want to see one of these, would you please raise your hand? Sure. Uh, I don't see any hands raised. Uh, so Pam and Chris, why don't we let those go by and ZBA can handle them on their own. Okay, nope. Thank you very much. Okay, so the time is 1011 and we're up to upcoming SBP, SPR and SUB applications. Anything to report? No, I don't no. think so. No, not okay. at this time. Nope. Good. Glad to hear it at this time of night. <laughs> um, planning board committee and liaison reports. Uh, we don't have a PVPC committee liaison report, I assume. And uh, Andrew, anything on CPAC? We did have a meeting um, I don't, a week, two, two weeks ago. Um, it was just good kind of going over the initial timeline. Uh, we will regroup in October, but the application window has opened. It's open for the, uh, the month of September. Uh, so if you have or aware of anybody who might have interest, please direct them to the website, to the town's website to get the application process done. Some folks um, have uh, had, you know, questions throughout the process. So it's, it's good to, get that in early in case uh, there is some question. Okay, thank you. Tom, anything for DRB? Um, I was not at the latest meeting. Um, I was traveling, which I missed the uh, planning board meeting. Um, I will catch up and I will actually get notes from that and report next time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Janet, oh, Janet's gone. So I guess we'll wait to hear on solar bylaw later. Um, CRC, Chris? Um, the CRC is going to be reviewing the um, flood mapping project tomorrow. Um, they've been spending their time recently on the rental registration, um, but tomorrow is going to be mostly about flood mapping. So other than that, I don't really have anything to report. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, the last next item is report of the chair. I, the chair doesn't have a report um, other than to thank you for your confidence in me, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, all right, uh, Chris, report of staff. Oh, I would just like to report that I'm very pleased that we had our reorganization and our elections, and I'm very pleased with the people who were um, nominated and elected. So thank you all for agreeing to serve. Okay. All right. So the time is 1014 and we may adjourn. Thank you all for staying with us. Good Thank night. Thank you, Nate. Thank you, right. Nate. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Nate. Feel, Thanks, feel better, Nate. Hey, Chris. Thanks, Bye. Man. You're Bye. welcome. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, everybody. All right. Good night, Pam. <laughs> okay, Mr. Marshall. Good night.